sailing the Mediterranean in search of lost civilizations to rediscover the great cities that vanished in the ancient past. Their legacy has lingered in our collective imagination for centuries, a reminder of our human frailty when faced with the awesome, destructive power of nature. And where better to begin than among the islands of Greece, where history and legend collide. You look uh, like a Greek god. <laughs> okay, I'm a Greek man. I don't know about the other. <laughs> Skipper Theo Marinos navigates us to our first port of call, the spectacular island of Santorini, or as the Greeks know it by its ancient name, Thera. With its white stucco houses teetering on the edge of sheer cliffs, to many, this is a bucket list vacation destination, a tourist paradise where the sea here is as warm as a jacuzzi. Oh, that's, that's great. But the warm water is a reminder that Santorini is an active volcano. Three and a half thousand years ago, a colossal volcanic eruption ripped out the heart of this island. Everywhere you can see evidence of this awesome destruction. Ancient ash. A pumice mantle over a hundred foot thick blankets the entire island. A great city buried beneath. Streets, three-story houses, beautiful wall paintings preserved. But the people who lived here obliterated. These were the Minoans, an advanced race who ruled the seas. And this island was an important outpost of their vast maritime kingdom. Now in this island of Atlantis, there was a great and wonderful empire. And many now believe the inspiration for the legend of Atlantis, first written about by the philosopher Plato. There were earthquakes and floods of extraordinary violence. And in a single dreadful day and night, the island of Atlantis was swallowed up by the sea and vanished. Some experts say that Plato's Atlantis was located in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, but others believe that the inspiration was the destruction of Santorini. Atlantis uh, civilization existed here in Santorini. Our skipper certainly thinks so. Uh, Plato described a circle island with a volcano in the center, destroyed in a one single night. That happened uh, to Santorini. And scientists here have recently discovered that the eruption from this supervolcano was even more destructive than previously thought. In terms of the consequences of the eruption, it is likely the worst explosion mankind has ever known. But the destruction didn't end there, says Costas Sianalakis, one of the world's foremost experts on tsunamis. The initial wave is about 300 feet high. Following in the wake of that colossal wave, we sail 90 miles south to the island of Crete, legendary birthplace of Zeus, and the heart of the Minoan Empire. Archaeologist Dr. Sandy McKillivray has spent more than 30 years investigating what happened to the Minoan civilization here. The sea comes up over all these buildings, knocking all these buildings down goes as far as that yellow field that you see up there at the end of the olive trees. Way back there. Way back there. This was one of its major towns. This was Main Street, separating these huge town blocks that were on either side. The whole town mm. is completely wiped out. 20, 25,000 people. Down at the water's edge, you can find spectacular evidence of the tsunami's destruction. There's um, bone, a wall plaster, more pottery, basically churned up households. This is, uh, these are fragments of an amphora, like a big, uh, big two-handled jar. Okay, there's the base of a cup. See that round base? Goes like that. Sides come up here. Put a handle on there. Wow. So someone might have been drinking from that as the wave came in, yeah. as they yeah. came to the end of their life. Entirely possible. I mean, isn't it amazing to just find this stuff here like this? I just can't believe that I'm holding maybe pieces of Atlantis in my hand. 
Like the people described in Plato's Atlantis, the Minoans were advanced, and their palaces, like here in the ruined Minoan capital, Knossos, were magnificent. This was like the Washington DC of its era, a center of power and civilization. They're the first culture in Europe that has running water coming down into their buildings. One of the things that we get from Minoan art, you see that men and women are equal. If anything, the women were more powerful. They just have this almost miraculous civilization. Miraculous, yes, but Atlantis? I really suspect that uh, the Minoan civilization uh, and Santorini is where Atlantis is. Amazingly, and despite the similarities to Atlantis, Dr. McKillivray is not so sure. Where is Atlantis? Ah, if it's not here, go west through the Pillars of Hercules into the Atlantic Ocean. He believes that when Plato wrote that Atlantis was beyond the Pillars of Hercules, he meant outside the Mediterranean. Do you think it's in the Atlantic? Well, I mean, I, I read Plato as an undergraduate. I did classics and um, developed a fairly high opinion. And uh, I really don't think it's, it's fiction. So, was Plato's inspiration the destruction of Santorini? Or is it just a story? Or perhaps, just perhaps, is there a lost Atlantis? somewhere beneath the ocean. Next, we travel west, across the Mediterranean, to another lost city. It too was destroyed by a volcano, but this place is definitely not a legend. Pompeii. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends in today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show. In a mere 30 minutes. Oh, yes, shop today with Joe Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go! International Day of the Girl! The strength and courage of these women is remarkable. What's your message to girls who want to make a difference? Believe in yourself. You can make it happen. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Way, way back into history. Over thousands of years. All over the Mediterranean. Great civilizations have risen and fallen. Some were known to historians, but others were lost to time. Troy in Turkey, like Atlantis, was thought to be a fiction until an archaeologist who believed the story was based on fact began excavating this hill and found it. When a Swiss explorer disguised as an Arab traveler entered this canyon, he rediscovered the secret hidden city of Petra one of the most exciting finds ever. As recently as 20 years ago, divers off the coast of Egypt found the ruins of an Egyptian city that had been swallowed by the sea. And these incredible structures on the islands of Malta are more than five and a half thousand years old, more ancient than Stonehenge and the pyramids. But the most celebrated of all lost cities lies on the west coast of Italy in the shadow of the volcano Vesuvius. At 12 noon, disaster struck. A massive explosion of molten rock flying into the air like a pine tree, one witness said. 
the volcano ejecting thousands of tons of materials per second. It fell here upon the horrified people of Pompeii, pumice and burning ash raining down on this city. It must have seemed like the end of the world. Pompeii and its sister city, Herculaneum, were utterly destroyed their people buried beneath an avalanche of ash. Everything was covered with this ash. Two thousand years later, chief archaeologist Massimo Asana and his team are digging out this vast and previously unexplored section of Pompeii. Archaeology used to be about patience and painstaking digging by hand. It still is. But now, scientists are also using 21st century technology to solve Pompeii's first century secrets. We are in the era of digitalization, laser scanning, 3D reconstruction, and of course also drone. This is the garden. The excavated city offers a fascinating glimpse into the Roman world. We are here discovering houses which are well preserved. A snapshot of life. 2,000 years ago. Incredible way to touch the past and the daily life of the uh, Pompeian in the first century AD. To the basics of life. It's a bread. Bread? Ah, this Pondition. is someone's a man thumbprint. Yes. And even graffiti. It's a campaign sign for the local lawmaker. All the time, they're discovering more. Here, writing with a date, October 17th, Important because it indicates that the eruption happened two months later than has always been thought. Just one day before that eruption, Pompeii was a thriving vacation resort for the Romans. There was an amphitheatre for gladiatorial combat and street after street of grand houses with beautiful gardens. Inside these palatial homes, the walls are covered with brightly coloured paintings, depicting a luxurious existence of leisure and pleasure. What a life these folks had. But for many, a terrible death. Thousands fled in panic, waiting to be rescued from the beaches by the fleet of galleys under the command of the great Roman admiral, Pliny. Others were not so lucky, suffocated by burning gas, then buried in a deadly rain of falling ash. This famous figure is crouching, as if in prayer, certainly in terror, and we're only now truly learning of the horrors they were going through. Back at the excavation, the professor and his team are uncovering more bodies and using the latest techniques are beginning to find out more about who these people were, like this man buried beneath a massive block of masonry. He tried to escape with a few coins, not, not really a huge amount of money, so we understand the status of this person. Now, for the skeleton, we started also the DNA analysis, and we will know everything about his biography. And these two victims of the volcano are believed to be a master and his slave. The team has even found the bodies of petrified horses. And this skull, found on the shore near Pompeii, is now being examined in another lab, with more CSI. Could it be, as many experts think, the skull of Pliny, the very man in charge of the Roman fleet who died while trying to rescue the survivors from the disaster zone? We should, soon, have the answer. And perhaps also, the answer to Pompeii's greatest mystery. Because, although more than a thousand bodies have now been recovered here, what happened to everyone else? The population of ancient Pompeii was 30,000. 30,000 people? In, inside the town. But they are out there, somewhere, says Professor Osana, hidden beneath the ash. And, maybe, tantalizing, there are other cities, other great civilizations, perhaps buried beneath the desert sand, or submerged beneath the sea, forgotten by history, but just waiting to be found.
Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. We're going to kick off the Pink Power and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. What's the best thing about being this age? You have nothing to prove because you already proved it. What does it feel like to be in a city that you love so much? I am humbly proud that I stuck up for my town. We all have the honor of helping reopen the doors. Broadway is back! The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. By the man, the For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. These are places we may not be able to visit for a while. Come with us as we take you there, into our incredible world. Woo! Ah, Italy. Where to begin in this land of romance, renaissance and romance? How about the place where quarantine was invented 600 years ago. If you're going to lock down, where better than in the most beautiful city in the world? Venice. A labyrinth of winding canals famed for its glorious art and architecture. The birthplace of a billion romances. Casanova once lived here. George Clooney got married here. And so did American Marie Ohanassian who met her gondolier husband, Roberto, in Venice. I'll give you a year, 1985, and got married two years later. I was here on vacation. 30 years of marriage, my friend. <laughs> yeah, it'll be 31. 31, <laughs> yes. How's it going? I'm, I'm a lucky guy, huh? <laughs> there is a famous Venetian tradition that says, if you kiss while passing under a bridge, you and your lover remain in love forever. In recent years, Venice discovered that its beauty can be a double-edged sword. The people who truly love it lost in a sea of selfie-taking tourists. We all got the selfie that we can leave now, but you don't even realize where you are. So Venice needs to be understood and needs to be savored. You live in history. Francesco da Mosta, whose family has lived in this Venetian house for generations, agrees. Venice doesn't need so much tourism. So much to him is destroying Venice. And when you lose the soul of a place, then it's lost. Then for almost every one of us, everything changed. In Venice, it meant overnight, the visitors vanished. As the world turned upside down, the pollution here disappeared. The water never looked clearer. More than ever, you could see why the Italians call this city on the sea La Serenissima, the most serene. Amazing, really, when you think that this was once a bustling metropolis, the trading center of the world. And by truly exploring this enchanted city, you can find that history around every corner.
The family that lived here at the Palazzo Pisani were modern day billionaires, merchants of Venice. Hello. <laughs> now it's cared for by Giovanni Gio. I can't nice believe you. this was someone's home. Of course, of course it was, absolutely. It's been a home of the Pisani family for over four centuries. Imagine the history this home has seen, the highs and lows, and survived it all, just about. 200 rooms and 400 windows. <laughs> I know that because we have to fix it every year. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of windows to repair. Within the walls of the palazzo, there's a trail of secrets. There are Masonic symbols everywhere. There are many and many secret passages everywhere. This palazzo is full of hidden staircases which goes up and down. This way, it takes exactly to the Mason temple. This is the Sala d'Oro, the golden room. And once it was totally covered with gold. As you can see on the wall, there's a little trace of the gold. Wow, and on the ceiling. And on the ceiling, of course, yes. The family fortune lost in gambling debts. This building is now a music center. For this grand house, just another chapter in its long history. Perhaps that's the story of Venice. It has endured, like its grandest gondolas, these elaborately detailed boats hidden away for most of the year. They are relics of the past, but in Venice, Gondolas are still transporting people around this floating citadel, as they have done for a thousand years. And maybe there's something about that history that might help us in these times of trouble. Across the country, another spot famous for its history, Florence. Back when travel was so easy, we took time to take in its domed cathedral, walk its cobbled streets, and cross its enchanting bridges. A place for meditation. And as any Tuscan will tell you, a place to have fun. Hey, kid. Hey. How's it going, buddy? Claudio. Welcome to Florence. <laughs> My friend and colleague, Claudio, who's as Italian as Armani, introduced me to the local cocktails. What are we going to drink? We're going to have an apple, well, a spritz, mm -hmm. which is half prosecco, okay. which is Italian champagne. And then you can put two things in it, either aperol or mm -hmm. campari. A little taste test. Yes. Okay. Salute. <laughs> Salute. Salute. Remember when you could share drinks without disinfecting the glass? I feel like we should hold hands. No. Within Florence's medieval walls lived many celebrated characters of the Renaissance. Who has walked on these streets? Michelangelo, Galileo, Galileo da, Vinci, da Vinci, and now us. <laughs> <laughs> what a fall from grace. <laughs> Let's get back to some historic drinking. Why not? <laughs> this is a 17th century statue of a wild boar. Yeah. And right. if you touch the nose, yes. it will bring you good luck. Okay. I'll give you a coin, put the coin in the mouth, okay. let it drop. Ah, uh, no luck. <laughs> what no, because happened? it needs to go through the grates. Oh, yes! Yes! <laughs> yeah, I love it. Avere più ghiaccio. Can oh. I have more ice in my drink? That's it. We should eat something, right? Yeah. Florence's answer to the hot dog. This is for you. Is that for me? All right. Yeah. Wow. So... Oh, you're eating it too? Well, well that's reassuring. Really you know. Have a go. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. So, what is um, it? What is it? It's meat. This is um, called lampredotto. Lampredotto, okay. It's the lining of a cow's stomach. <laughs> it's kind of tripe, <laughs> but worse. <laughs> that's what I just ate. I need to drink to forget. This is called a Negroni. Okay. Very famous in Italy. It was invented in Florence. Yes. It's called a Negroni because it was invented by a count. Wow. Called a count. Camillo Negroni. Yes. How does it taste? It's pretty really good. I like it. I like it. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I love you. You're the best. <laughs> you're the best. <laughs> no, you're the best. When you After all that excitement, it's time to slow down. In Italy, that means 
heading south. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. All right, it just fit too. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends in today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, that's your shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news. All right, it just did. In the region of Campania, high on a hilltop, is this picturesque Italian town of old houses and narrow streets. Oh, oh. Very narrow streets. We've travelled to sun-bleached southern Italy, where the pace of life is slower. In this typical Italian town, the locals are well, buongiorno. Um, hi, how are you? Buongiorno, buonasera. <laughs> Wait, you're not Italian. No, I'm not Italian. <laughs> Just like you. Ciao. Ciao. Where are you from? New York City. I'm from Los Angeles, California. Uh, we're from Santa Barbara. Please, will someone explain? Ciao. Hi, Carlo? <laughs> yes. Carlo from California has emigrated to Guardia San Fernandi, a town founded before Columbus found America. We're kind of right in the middle of the whole Italy thing. The Italy thing? The Italy thing. What do you love about the Italy thing? Uh, it's kind of like I've been dropped in an alternative universe where people are still really nice to each other. Ciao! Ciao! This old-fashioned place where folks say hello, or ciao, was slowly consigned to the past. But now, more than 100 Americans and others have bought property in Guardia kind of a little America. Piccolo Americano, they call it. Ciao. Ciao. Glenn is still refurbishing, but plans to keep some of the old features. Love the old life, yeah. His house, once home to a wealthy Italian Contessa. This was the Contessa's bedroom. Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? Admittedly, you can get a little carried away. You don't have to be Shakespearean aristocracy to live here, says restoration expert Benny Adamo. For $15,000, you can have this view. Or if you have a spare $170,000, this 18th century palazzo is yours. Frescoes. Yeah, frescoes. Look at that. OK, it's a bit of a doer-upper. Look, is, is the bed included? Yeah, the bed is included. You can take whatever you want. When you buy these houses, you buy a piece of their history, too. <laughs> Rooms untouched. 1784. A journal written before George Washington became president. Incredible. This is what life is about. And what so much of Italy is about, with its rich history. One day, our lives will be history too. But the magic of Italy, its culture, its beauty, and the way it just makes your heart sing, will always be with us. Sandra, thanks so much for doing this. It's great to see you. Hi, Willie. Great to be with you. I'm very anxious to talk about The Chair. I told you I just got to see the first two episodes. Before we do that, though, I want to wish you a very happy milestone birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. 
you had an amazing post where you stopped and sort of took stock of your life and career and thanked just about everybody you could think of and recalled all these great shows that, that have made your career what it is. Yes, you know, I'm not a big poster, but I woke up early that morning and my mom had already texted me. <laughs> and she's like, well, basically, they tell you mass at eight o'clock in the morning. And I'm like, okay. I woke up and I basically spoke with my parents. And milestone birthdays are wonderful times to take stock of things. And I just wanted, to, I was really thinking about, you know, my friendships and my family and actually uh, my work. And I just really wanted to thank everybody, you know. It was, it, it, it's a great uh, immediate way to send out a message. I, it was it was great to do, yeah. You know? is, is it overwhelming in some ways to stop at this point and say, oh, because you are moving so fast in your life and your career to stop and say, oh, wow, look at, the, look at all the things I've done in these years. You know, actually doing stuff like, like this, of speaking to people who will ask me questions like this, <laughs> those are the moments that I actually have to stop and go, oh, what have I been doing? What have I been trying to make? Because people will put things into perspectives that I have not thought of. Um, and it's a really good checkup. Well, you've got something great to celebrate with the chair, the new series on Netflix. Oh, there she is. Our first lady chair woman. Explain for people who are thinking about watching it, sort of the, the plot, and also what about this great character drew you in? The chair is a dramedy, and it's kind of like a workplace comedy that's set in academia. So I play the, uh, the role of ji Kim, Professor Kim, who's just been the newly minted chair in the English department at, a, at Pembroke University, it's a fictitious university. And it's centered around a transgressive act that one of the fellow professors, uh, Bill Dobson, played by Jay Duplass, does in class. And it's then navigating as the chair how to manage the fallout from a, a very ill-informed mistake and how to keep um, her, the department, the English department, and in like the humanities relevant. But it also touches on so many things without uh, being pointed at it. It's like what it is to be a woman and a person of color who enters into a leadership role, who's trying to change a very antiquated and patriarchal white system. You know what I mean? How she relates to her students and to her coworkers, how she relates to her elderly father, how she relates to her adoptive daughter. Um, so it was a great opportunity to play such a, a a dynamic and full-fleshed role. And I give all the credit to Amanda Peet who created this world. As you say, she steps into this place that has been run forever by old white guys. And in many cases, these are cartoonish old white guys kind of fumbling around, hanging on to their tenure. Could you dig into some personal experience as a woman of color who stepped into these prominent roles and, and roles of leadership and sort of understand what she was going through? Sure. And I'll also try and frame also that hopefully, hopefully no one is a caricature in this piece. So even though you have, you know, older white professors, male professors, one, you know, the brilliant Bob Balaban who plays uh, Professor uh, Elliot Rance, hopefully you're seeing his perspective on, on the effect of, of being the older generation and perhaps not have paid enough close attention to what the students want and how they need to learn. So I'll just start with that. And then uh, the next part of your question, which is like, do I know what it's like? Um, yeah, yeah, I do. And I, I think that that has got to have informed how I approach, you know, Jian. I, I, I can't exactly specifically point to what, but um, one of the things that I feel like I have learned in my career that is a little bit uh, ahead of Professor Kim is, um, is that change is slow when you are an individual facing an institution. And for me not to lose heart because for anyone who knows who's tried to enact change, it's never the way that you think it's going to happen. Right. And the challenges are there for you to only get more specific and deeper into your commitment to change. 
Um, and I, I, you just see Professor Kim just trying to balance all these things at once. Um, and so you have a real good balance of comedy and pathos. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. We're going to kick off the Pink Power and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. What's the best thing about being this age? You have nothing to prove because you already proved it. What does it feel like to be in a city that you love so much? I am humbly proud that I stuck up for my town. We all have the honor of helping reopen the doors. Broadway is back! This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Dr. Kim's name, which as, a, as an Asian woman, you, as an American woman, you say that was really important that her name was authentically Korean. Can you explain that a little bit? Sure. It's like I can trace, I feel like how Hollywood has progressed or widened. You know, when I was on Grey's Anatomy for 10 years as Christina Yang, it was the Obama years. And uh, specifically, the, the show never addressed people's ethnicity nor did it really kind of address people's home lives. It just was the style of the show. So I never got to really necessarily explore what other parts of Christina was. And then with uh, the show um, Killing Eve, I was able to bring a certain aspect of Eve's uh, uh, cultural heritage in the third season, but that's what the show is not really about that. It's the show is really about the exploration of and the discovery of of a, a woman's own psyche. But in the chair, when I first opened that first page of the pilot and I saw that Dr. Kim's name is, is Jeun Kim, uh, I just noted it in terms of the growth of my own career that now I can, I can play a character who specifically has a Korean name and all the characters are gonna call her that name correctly. And I do, it was significant to me. Um, I think uh, there's been a lot of accommodation or denial or just not existence of the fact that people have, um, they, in, in their names, their ethnicity is, is, is in their names. So it was just great to, it was great to see and it was really important to me. It feels like this fits into something you've been thinking about in your recent roles, which is to give authentic Asian experiences in the in the parts you take and in your performances. Different, as you say, from something like Grey's Anatomy, which just sort of fit into the plot. You can sort of tell more of the story. And I feel like we see that in the chair when she goes home and her father lives with her. And we see symbols of religion on the wall, which you've talked about in your old in your own childhood. So what does it mean to you personally to be able to have that power in Hollywood to say, this is how the role is going to be. This is how I'm going to play that. Well, it's definitely not as, let's say cut and dry in that way, because for me, it's more like finding the right collaborators. Finding, because I am I'm not a writer at this point in my life, you know what I mean? But I'm not, I never want to, I never want to limit myself, but uh, uh, it's about trying to find the world and, and, and the voices that I am interested in, in uh, inhabiting and collaborating with. So, you know, Amanda set the whole world. This was always going to be a part of it. 
uh, Dr. Kim was always going to be taking care of an elderly parent and she was always going to be taking care of an adoptive daughter. So no matter what, you get to open up a lot of story dynamic with that. And that was also one of the things that really, really interests me. And is there a lot more of that now, Sandra, is just by virtue of all the different outlets that we have for those shows added with a heightened consciousness and awareness that we need more of it? I, I, you know what? I think so. I'm almost afraid to say, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and anyone who's a person of color knows what I'm doing when I'm saying, I don't even want to say that it might be true, but it might be true because there is more openness to it because there is a uh, more interest in it. What I hope develops alongside of it is a certain type of patience and a certain type of support that comes in the form of development. You know, voices have to be developed. Do you know if you suddenly want a, a, a storyline based on X, Y, Z, because it's you seem to think that the public wants it, you need to develop the voices to be able to take on those leadership roles to make that happen. Because ultimately what it depends on is that the storytelling is interesting and authentic and true. You know what I mean? Because you can have whoever you want on camera, it doesn't matter. But if it's not interesting, if it is not truthful, I don't think people will watch it. I think that's probably right. And, and as you talk about bringing your own experience to roles like this, I love reading the story of your own upbringing outside Ottawa, where you really had to convince your parents that performance and acting was the thing for you. You were proven to be very right. Um, but what were those early years like when you said, mom and dad, I know you maybe don't get this but this is what I want to do. You know, I'm one of those extremely lucky people who have a good relationship with their parents. And what I've learned uh, from that experience uh, and obviously growing and maturing as a person is that adversity is extremely important in the development of a person's character. And the time, you know, my parents are immigrants from South Korea, you know what I mean? And in a very, very, very typical uh, Korean American immigrant kind of upbringing, just very middle of the road, typical education and having a good job and security is very important. Anyone who was a child of an immigrant knows this. Um, so my parents, it was very, very foreign, you know, the entertainment world or the artistic world, it was very, very foreign to them. But what I am so blessed with is that the way that they were an obstacle to me, it only makes you tougher in a good way. I've spoken about this before. It's like, you know, if you have the two most important people telling you that you shouldn't do it or that you can't do it, you uh, and you still do it anyway, you do it anyway, um, you have a, a, you just built an internal confidence and you can only build that by going through it. So when you are pounding the pavement, when people are saying no, when you have self-doubt, you already have a certain layer of confidence because you've already surpassed, you know, uh, the, the doubt of the two most important people to you. I, I was very lucky in my, in, my, in my career so far, you know, in the early days, I had success quite early. Yeah. And I was able to show them very full pieces you know, where the entire film was about my character. I did this film early on by Mina Shum called Double Happiness. And it was about this character named Jade Lee who wants to be an actress, is in a very typical Chinese Canadian home. And it's a very simple coming of age story where she just eventually leaves home to pursue her dreams. When my parents saw that, my mom said to me, Is this what you basically wanted to tell us? Mm. And I just felt so seen by her. Like she got it. I mean, my parents really eased off the, the gas pedal because I was fortunate enough to be able to show them my work. And they could understand that, um, that there's meaning in, in that work. And I think it's a, little, it's a little tricky and hard for immigrant parents parents, let's just say, to understand that if their child is an artist, uh, just to, 
to not be afraid, even if they fail, or even if they're hungry and just eating pizza for three days. If they're, if you see your child that wants to be an artist in some sort of way, just to, just to give them a little space to try it out. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. We're going to kick off the Pink Power and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. What's the best thing about being this age? You have nothing to prove because you already proved it. What does it feel like to be in a city that you love so much? I am humbly proud that I stuck up for my town. We all have the honor of helping reopen the doors. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go! International Day of the Girl. The strength and courage of these women is remarkable. What's your message to girls who want to make a difference? Believe in yourself. You can make it happen. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go! International Day of the Girl. The strength and courage of these women is remarkable. What's your message to girls who want to make a difference? Believe in yourself. You can make it happen. News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're going to do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening, with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life. In primetime and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. The moment when you win the Golden Globe for Killing Eve, you get up there and they showed on the broadcast, I think before you even got to the microphone, your parents. And your dad stands up and breaks into applause and you're doing okay and then you see them, you you could see it sort of wash over you. What was that moment like to see your parents who were skeptical at the outset stand in the back and watch you receive this huge award and to watch their daughter be so successful at what she chose to do? You know, I have been shameless with my parents. I have brought them to so many awards. <laughs> they froze. They really, really froze. But it's profoundly, profoundly satisfying that when you reach a certain type of milestone, and I would say that for me, it was hosting the show, um, that uh, your parents who support you so deeply are actually there in the audience. Yeah, it's profoundly um I, 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 satisfying to be able to come to a certain point in your career when in the moment that you're celebrated, that your parents get to witness it. I mean, you should ask them what they feel. Like. <laughs> I honestly, it's, it was, it's such a blur, you know, it's such a blur, but it was also um, really important to me to be able to publicly thank them, you know, and, and, you know, you don't, you, you, I, I mean, I'm honestly just doing it in, in the moment because my parents are there. But, but um, subsequently, I, I just re, I, I, it was reflected back to me that I think that it meant a lot to uh, a lot of child children of immigrants mm. and a lot of uh, Asian American kids and just people uh, to be able to express gratitude and love to their parents publicly. I don't think I have to ask them. I saw their faces that night. <laughs> I, think they were, <laughs> I think they were pretty proud. I think they were pretty proud. So you talked about that early success in Canada, and then you make the leap over to American television, and you mentioned Arliss. I think most people point to Sideways as the breakout moment for you. Did it feel that way in real time when everyone said, oh, who's she? I like her. Let's put her in more stuff. <laughs> You know, I think it was actually a timing thing because um, Sideways and Grey's Anatomy happened at the same time. Mm -hmm. 
You know what I mean? So those are those, uh, you know, just mysterious times of like, you know, uh, the stars are aligned. And I think that did happen. And, you know, working on Sideways was one of the highlights of my career. It's, just, I, it's I think it still holds up. It's Definitely. been like a while now, but I, I think it still holds up. So that kind of like one, two punch of like Sideways and then Grey's Anatomy, it was, uh, uh, it was a, a, a real, <laughs> a real shot out of the cannon. Um, but I, but I also am, am so happy that, you know, it happened in my early thirties. So I already had uh, a, a career behind me and a, and a fairly good amount of grounding to be able to uh, receive uh, what that meant to suddenly come into people's consciousness. And it kind of felt like it seems that with that sideways success, you said to yourself, I don't have to do the girlfriendy sidekicky thing. I can be front and center, be a central character. When you make those certain like leaps in your career, you change the point of view of what you're going to accept. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, it was not like, it was not in the terms of, I don't want to be. X, Y, Z. Right. It was very much like, I only want to play um, dynamic characters. I only want to play things that inspire me. And that's, that's always a really challenging time to be able to move your career into a place of inspiration as opposed to of necessity. So mm -hmm. I was very lucky to be able to decide and start practicing that. And that's, that's definitely when, Grayson News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're gonna do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening, with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life in primetime and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're gonna do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening, with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life. In primetime and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. So Grey's Anatomy comes along. You talk about being shot out of a cannon. There's no bigger cannon to be shot out of in terms of a show that was right in the cultural zeitgeist that people were talking about the morning after all the time. What was it like in your life to be thrust onto that show, to have this big role on the biggest show on TV, to have more and more people interested in your life, to know who you are, to say hello to you on the street. How did it change your life? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> big question. And uh, I don't think that, I mean, I'm guessing that, to be perfectly honest, it was traumatic. Hmm. <laughs> it's traumatic. And the reason why I'm saying that is, uh, I don't know whether it's just I come from a different generation or my temperament as an artist is that you know that the best work or the work that you or, or the circumstances you need to do your work is with a lot of privacy. Hmm. Um, and that's and that's just to find the authentic self. And so when one loses one's anonymity, you have to build skills uh, to still try and be real. Um, so I know this is probably not an answer that people are particularly interested in, but it is a truthful one. But having been in it, I've 
I've grown to adapt and I've grown, it really forces you to, to grow internally, for at least for me, internally, to be able to, I, I mean, I went from uh, not being able to go out or not being able to go, like hiding in restaurants or never looking out, to then being able to receive and manage um, and manage projection, manage attention, uh, manage expectation while not losing the sense of self. And that takes a little while to figure out. How do you do it though? How do you do it when all the eyeballs in the restaurant are on you? How do you say, okay, this is my life. It's not normal, but it's my life. Here's how I'm going to manage it. How did you make those adjustments? Because I've heard the same from other actors who've been shot out of a cannon on a big show or a big movie and all of a sudden their life like that, the weekend the movie comes out is totally different. Mm. Um, well, have a good therapist. <laughs> I'm not joking. Important. Yeah. No, I'm not joking. It's very, very important because there's a lot that one would need to talk about that you should not talk about with your partner or friends or family. You don't burden them with that. It's a very specific road. And so one, have a good therapist. Hopefully you have a good support system as a support network. You know, I am very lucky that I do have a very great support system. Um, and you just have to work at finding your way to stay grounded. And a lot of times that's by saying no. Hmm. You've done well with it, certainly. And from the, the question that always comes up when someone leaves a show like that is, okay, what do you do from there? What next? And here comes Killing Eve and you have this other great success where, as I said, you win another Golden Globe Award. Uh, what was it about that part that so attracted you and what makes that show so popular? People are so obsessed with it. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, I can tell you definitely what intrigued me um, was Phoebe Waller-Bridge's tone. Yeah. Because I had not seen it before and I knew it was fresh. Like I really knew it was fresh right off the page. And I knew I could, I knew I could follow it. I like the circumstance where, you know, it's this kind of very middle of the road, middle of her life woman and every woman who then develops an extremely dangerous and obsessive relationship with a, with an assassin. Like those are crazy circumstances. <laughs> but what I could also see in the piece, Piece, which I was very interested in exploring, that it's about a woman's self-discovery. And that was ultimately what was so intriguing. And, and hopefully that element, as well as um, a type of very um, exciting uh, push and pull relationship between Eve and Villanelle is exciting to people. Uh, but mostly, it's, I, I hope it is, is that you see these two women trying to figure out themselves by somehow needing to be in relationship with each other. And that was really interesting. That was really, really interesting to me. Like, how, how do you figure out how to be in relationship with a character that wants to kill you? <laughs> right. That's a big question. That's a big question. Well, part of the fun of the show is that you have a different woman writing every season. So can you give us a little look ahead to season four of what your fans might expect? Well, I honestly, I am just in the middle. I'm here in London, just in the middle of shooting the, the season four, the last season of Killing Eve. And I can tell you nothing. I knew it. Except oh, I thought I might break you, Sandra. <laughs> Except that, you know, we're really, really working hard to try and like really honor that relationship and, and, and to find out what their, how their story not ends, but somehow, somehow finishes at, at this moment. You know, um, that's what we're really working hard on, trying to find that, that, that way to, to service all those characters beautifully. Very diplomatic answer. It felt like you were giving something and you really weren't. You were such a pro, such a pro. <laughs> Sandra, I really appreciate your time. Congratulations on the chair. It's so fun to talk to you. I know you're busy working, so thanks for taking the time. Thank you so much.
So here's the deal. When we started thinking about this podcast, there was one chef in particular I really wanted to talk with. I have known uh, Alexander Smalls for almost 30 years and have been at his table. He's been at my table uh, more times than I can count. Uh, (laughs) He is a chef. He's a restaurateur, a restaurant owner, cookbook author, an accomplished opera singer. He is everything that is New York. Uh, And what I love most about him and his work is his commitment to making every meal an occasion. And he takes what he's known from his travels around the world to his upbringing in South Carolina, in low country, uh, and he considers each and every detail just as important. As- and so, to me, the most important part of a Thanksgiving meal is stuffing. And I knew if I went to Alexander and said, Alexander, what's your go-to? He would bring something spectacular, and he would bring something that's inspired by the flavors of his own childhood. So, uh, low country oyster cornbread dressing with crispy slab bacon. Ladies and gentlemen, Alexander Smalls. Welcome (laughs) to Cooking Up a Storm, my friend. I am the bacon. (laughs) Well, you certainly are a bit of a ham, so we'll we'll go with that. Uh, (laughs) What's your favorite part of the Thanksgiving meal? Oh, my God, eating. (laughs) Um, But uh, if I walk backwards from that, um, I love preparation. Mm -hmm. I menu, shopping, uh, the prep work, and it starts days in advance. Um, So I love that whole Mm -hmm. um, ballet, really. Um, I love it. And then, of course, there's nothing like laying the spread out on the table. I mean, it's like festive and full and celebratory. When you were a kid growing up, what was the part of the meal, the, the, the dish that you couldn't wait for? Oh, well, no surprise. The dressing. <laughs> <laughs> the dressing. The dressing had the most flavors. It had the juice of the turkey. It had the gravy mm-hmm. of the turkey. Um, it was full of, of savory um, uh, 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 spices and aromatics and excuse to pile tons of cranberry sauce on top. Yeah. <laughs> well, so here's the thing. I grew up uh, here in, in New York and my mom called it stuffing. You call it dressing. Are they the same thing? They are. They're just prepared differently. And what I mean by that is the stuffing goes inside the cavity of the bird mm-hmm. and dressing goes in a casserole dish. Um, And it also is a different texture because the dressing dries out more and has a crispy uh, crust. uh, And sometimes the topping is also crispy. Um, So it's a side dish Mm -hmm. as opposed to being part of a dish. (laughs) Okay, because see, what I've always done is I like to make my stuffing in the turkey. But I make enough of it, like double it, and then bake it in the oven and then combine the two. So you kind of get the wet, but the juices of the turkey and everything, and then, but the drier part so that they average out. Mm-hmm. Dressing purists, uh-huh. they, it would never touch the Are stomach. there dressing purists? Well, there's one. <laughs> <laughs> and you're the only person I know that mixes stuffing and dressing. <laughs> Maybe I'm a trendsetter. Maybe you. Maybe I'm are. ahead of the curve. Yeah. Beyond the curve. <laughs> <laughs> when you have make this this dressing because it, it it's got a lot of flavor profile to it almost in in some ways it, it probably stands out more than a lot of side dishes mm. most people would have mm. how do you adjust the other dishes that you're making for thanksgiving so that this is un- unless you want this to be the centerpiece well, I don't adjust things because, first of all, I mean, it's an ensemble piece, mm-hmm. um, uh, every meal that you cook. But then, you know, you always have solos and you have stars. This is a star dish, you know, um, not for everyone because mm-hmm. some people just simply throw some, some, some fruit and some breadcrumbs and call it a day. Um, but for me, this is a complete, um, you know, uh, satisfying dish that could stand on its own. Um, so I, I can't say that I um, hold back on my other dishes, but uh-huh. I balance it because, you know, this is what I do. I mean, I, I know how to balance a plate of food. <laughs> Literally and figuratively. <laughs> Voila. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
So, you know, again, this dish, what I've, I, I, I find fascinating in that it really does harken back to your upbringing, yeah. and especially with the oysters. The oysters have a certain uh, connection for you and your dad. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, th my father created, and, and well, I should say, it is out of his tradition that uh, the oyster cornbread dressing, I mean, this is one of the few things my father, my father had maybe five dishes mm -hmm. that he made supremely. They were just unbelievable. And and he made nothing else. If you asked him to boil water, it would be questionable. But those <laughs> five <laughs> dishes, and they were all these low country, you know, heirloom recipes. And we used to sit at the dining room table, uh, sorry, the kitchen table, um, and shuck oysters, you know, together. Um, he and my grandfather would make a trip down to the, uh, to the um, what we used to call the um, old country, uh, down to Beaufort, South Carolina, where our relatives had all this property and land, and they would fish and do all this stuff. And uh, they would come back with just baskets. All this stuff would be going on. So it comes out of that kind of ritual. Mm -hmm. And my dad and I would sit at the table and he taught me how to pop oysters at an early age. He'd start them. Then he'd give me the back of a spoon, literally, and let me pop open. And, uh, and then we would save the oysters and the juice. My mother would be simmering milk, for mm -hmm. example, for oyster stew or, or a, a broth in order to make it for the low country, you know, uh, oyster cornbread stuffing. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. I forecast yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. This is fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. People really don't know what's going to happen. Really a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. Most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends in today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, that's so shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. You know, one of the people that had an impact on you, and, and I was fortunate, I really consider myself fortunate to have met and talked to uh, Edna Lewis, mm. who was the uh, doyen, the godmother of... Uh, of of southern cooking. Yes, absolutely. Um, and and was and I was funny because she was when I met her she was working at what was I think the longest running oldest running uh, 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 restaurant in New York, Gage and Tolner in Brooklyn. Right. What was her influence on you? Wow. Well, it was everything. I mean, she essentially is the essence of farm to table, you know. And uh, in her books, she. 
uh, documented, you know, uh, the the ritual of farming and its importance and and its profound um, uh, imprint on on Southern uh, African uh, American uh, people, and she. She she kept those traditions alive, and she brought them uh, into into view uh, uh, and into uh, some of the best uh, touted restaurants. Uh, she preserved those recipes, and at the same time, she was um, you know a, a beautiful, uh, elegant, grand Stevie. woman. Yes. Oh yeah, and she uh, was kind of a guiding light, if you will. What's the one thing people need to know if they're going to host Thanksgiving dinner this year? Oh, well, first of all, you have to offer variety because you have people with so many uh, limitations or, or concerns. But then I have some of my vegan friends who've come to dinner. And, but, you know, I make sure I have tons of vegetables, you know, legumes, lots of beans, lots of non-protein products to, to be very satisfying. And in some instances, you know, uh, I might make the vegetarian version of my dressing. Alexander, what's the one thing you, you try to do every year for Thanksgiving? I would say that you know, in a world where I'm constantly going and moving around, I try really hard to be home so I can give Thanksgiving to my friends who are in the city. You know, um, I've always been that way since a kid. Uh, I would call my parents up and say, I'm not coming home. There's so many of the orphans who uh, don't have anywhere to go. So I'm cooking for them. And, and, and it's something I still enjoy. So I try to be at home so I can open the door, whether it's for six people, you know, or 30. Last year, Thanksgiving, for a lot of people, was not Thanksgiving, right. in, in a sense. You know, right. We couldn't be with family. We couldn't right. be with friends. Do you think that there will be a, a, a more deeper meaning and, and import to Thanksgiving this year? I hope so. I mean, if I could wish um, anything, uh, it would be that um, that those honored traditions uh, that you know people have um, sort of assigned and gifted the occasion of, of gathering. Um, you know, when they do this year, uh, they remember and and really. Uh, are thankful for the grace of being able to come together again. I mean, we need that. News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're going to do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening, with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life. In primetime and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to you today. Let's go! International Day of the Girl. The strength and courage of these women is remarkable. What's your message to girls who want to make a difference? Believe in yourself. You can make it happen. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. Didn't fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. News is more than a headline. 
It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're gonna do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening, with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life. In primetime and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. How did you come up with this? I didn't have to. It's traditional. I made this dish with my father, not my mother, with my father. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he was the low country expert. Uh -huh. and, uh, and the big thing was, was the oysters. Oysters were a big thing, you know, but it's traditional. So, you know, it's second nature for me. Mm. Wow. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, it's because it, it's somewhat, it makes a, a very dramatic presentation. <laughs> uh, and, and what people, you are probably, to the best of my knowledge, the only chef, professional chef I know, who's also a professional opera singer. I may be the only one. The only one I know. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you transition from opera to singing? I mean, from opera to, 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 to being a chef. Yeah, well, you know, um, I have seen life through two lenses, music and food. And in fact, in my last cookbook, I bring all that together, Meals, Music and Muses, where essentially I talk about my life through the lens of music genres, opera, gospel, you know. Um, uh, so as a kid, you know, I started taking classical piano and that then evolved into my desire to sing and to sing opera. In the meanwhile, I had lots of chefs in my family and food was everything. You grow up in South Carolina in a small one horse town, you know, everything evolved around the table and food and everything happened there. I learned early that the person who had the power was the person who wheeled the spoon in the kitchen. Ah. I wanted that. I wanted that. All right. Well, <laughs> so this is how it all came together. So you've got the power here now. Yes. We're making this. What? How do we get started, Ali? Okay. All right. Well, let me swap places okay. with you. Swapping. Okay. All right. Let's start right here. This is this is easy. All right. So I'm gonna first uh, basically spray this pan like that, and then just with a little cooking. Yeah, spray. just a little cooking spray, uh -huh. you know. And then I'm gonna take some of this aluminum foil and cover it here because because I don't like to clean up. And you're, so you're, you're basically baking uh, uh, slab bacon. I am basically baking slab bacon, okay, so absolutely. You, you line the pan, and, and now you're putting one of those great little grid I wire am. mesh things. Now, on. may I have my spray back? Yes, you may. <laughs> I was just trying to keep things clean. OK, all right, so here we go. So you're spraying the, the, spraying the wire that. grid. I am not having my bacon stick uh -uh. at all. I'll give you this too. Okay. All right. So here we go. So the trick is basically to lay them out in such a way that they have space. Okay. How much bacon do you use? Well, um, again, for a casserole dish that's about nine inches by 13, we're doing about a cup. Okay. Now, you know, this is going to cook and it's going to get smaller. Yeah, I'm going to do this a little faster. It's going to get smaller, mm -hmm. and so this is why you want to cut it at least an inch wide and a third thick, you know, so that you really have a nice bite. Yes. Okay. Although I will admit, I would, I would double or triple that because I will probably eat some of this <laughs> as, as well, we cook. Well, exactly, cook. exactly. So but go. that's a chef's secret. Ah. All right. All right. So then I'm going to put this in a 375 degree oven. Okay, for about Okay, hours. that's been preheated. Mm -hmm. You know, well, I want it to get really crisp up. So I, you know, I mean, of course, as a chef, do I time anything? No. But let's just say that it needs to be in there a good 25 minutes, okay. something like that. And it's going to come out looking like this? It's going to come out looking like that. Right. Now, is this crispy enough? No. Oh. And in case you were wondering why this cast iron skillet is here. I was. Please okay. do the honors. Because what we're going to do now is um, essentially crisp it up even more because it has to withstand a lot of liquid ah. and it needs to stay firm and somewhat crunchy <laughs> so we can really have that texture working. You know, both as something you feel in your mouth, but right. also you taste. Okay. So this will do this for about 20 minutes. We'll check on it later. Now I see 
oysters here that are uh, un, 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 unshucked. I know. How I know. hard is it to shuck an oyster? Well, you know, I started shucking oysters with my father as a kid. And I loved it. I mean, I was a kid. I was like five, six years old. But I mean, there we were. And he would give, he would start them for me. And then uh -huh. he'd give me the, the back of the knife or, or the teaspoon. And I would pry open. Uh -huh. And the, 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 the thing about uh, oysters is uh, that, let's see. So you want to get into that little area there and twist. And boom, look at that. Is it happening for you, Al? <laughs> okay. Okay. So here is the oyster. So right. we, we're going to take this oyster out, right. but we're going to keep the juice. So how many of these are we going to do for this dish? Well, you need about 18 to 23. Okay. You know, wait, you know, and this wait, is 18 to 23. Why wouldn't it just be 24? Well, I'll tell you why. Because you know, you're buying them by the pound or the pint, and that's how they come. <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> but if you put 26 <laughs> in there, who cares, right? <laughs> All right, so move along with moving, me. Moving, moving. So that juice is going to go over in okay, here. Okay, we got some to, juice there. Yes, yes, yes. We already have some here. All right, so here we go. So these are the vegetables that okay. occupy this dish here. And and this is celery. This is uh, red bell peppers, onions, and I like a lot of corn. Even though I have oh. corn in my cornbread, mm -hmm. I like a lot of corn. So it's optional, the okay. corn. But I put that in. I sauteed it in some butter, you know, just so it got... Uh, nice and translucent to blah, 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 maybe 10 minutes at most. Boom, that. Right. And now we come over here. Mm -hmm. Now the, what's going on in this bowl is that we've um, we baked some buttermilk cornbread. Right. And I like to use bread as day old. Okay. All right, because again, it adds to the texture mm -hmm. and it helps to, to really stand up to all the liquid, okay? So the, the, the white bread has been torn mm -hmm. and then it has been, uh, uh, either left out right. or toasted, mm -hmm. you know, just a little bit. You don't want the color, no. but again, you want the texture. Right. So we've combined these in here, okay? okay. So the next thing that happens is that we uh, th we have chicken stock. Yes. And we have the oyster juice. Uh, juice mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to combine these, essentially, right. to um, to get two cups. Now, what I need you to do, yes. Al, is, is grab those eggs. Okay. And basically put those eggs in here. Can you see those numbers? <laughs> yes, yes. That's two cups. Oh, good. That's what I thought. Okay. And then we have a little whisk over here. And I do mean little. Goodness gracious. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what they say about a man and his whisk. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Thank you very much. All right. So then we're going to get well, on with the business of it. We got a bigger one over here. Hold on. That's all right. I'm making progress. Oh, you got it? All right. I'm going to give it to you because what I'm going to do is take our vegetables. Mm -hmm. There's so much flavor in here. Oh, and I forgot to mention that I have grape tomatoes oh. in here. Again, now that wasn't a low country thing, that's an Alexander thing. Mm -hmm. A little more texture, you know, a little more uptown with it all. Mmm, do you smell the sage? A little rosemary, it's all in here. Celery seeds, I know. You follow the recipe. Oh, yes. Okay, that looks good. I'll give me some of that. All right, all at once or? Well, give me half. Okay. Oh. Doesn't that smell good? It does. All right, give me more. Okay. <laughs> give me more. <laughs> give, me, give me all now, of it. When do we add the bacon? Oh. 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 No, no, go ahead. Keep going. Yeah, give it all to me. All righty. Uh, this is toasted really well, so it's really picking it up nicely. So this is kind of like a, a, a casserole. Yeah, well, you know, uh, I mean, but again, you could put this in your turkey. Mm -hmm. All would be well. <laughs> all uh, would be all well. All would be well. <laughs> 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 yes, indeed. Okay, we've got this mixed up. Good. Now, you've got all this. There's some, there's some other spices seasoning. Yes, yeah. yes, okay. Look there. That's, this is the cayenne. Mm -hmm. You want? Isn't that wonderful? Because you know, you know, the food really has mm -hmm. to speak to you. How so much you salt do we want? Want that flavor? Just a teaspoon. Okay. Yeah, a flat one. Mm-hmm. Pepper. Wonderful. Yes. Just eyeball it. You know, give us some of that. That looks good. Yeah. 
Okay, Al. All now right. the nutmeg. Oh. So now the nutmeg needs to be grated, okay. as you know. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to give it a go? Sure. All right. And you can eyeball that. We do about a teaspoon, a flat teaspoon. Okay, yes. Oh, my goodness, the listen smell the, of that. And listen to the sound of it. Mmm. It sounds like I'm scratching. That's special. <laughs> All right, you've scratched enough. Wonderful. Right. Okay. And our last but not least, ah. the crispy bacon. Oh, the crispy bacon. Oh, no, we must have the crispy bacon because that's mm. going to give us that depth of flavor. All right. So now this goes in there. Okay. Just half. Just half. Right. Half. Because we have to do our oysters. So you just kind of layer it in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We'll do. Okay. And then we just stagger our oysters so that uh, not, they don't reach the ends because mm -hmm. we don't want them to cook on the end. Ah. So we just stagger them in there. And of course, as the chef, you always know where they are. Yes. Hello. Hello, oysters. <laughs> mm. I'm going to enjoy you in just a little bit. <laughs> oh, that's looking good. Yes, it is. We've layered that. We've layered, and now we're going to finish ah. it off like this. Ta da, ta da, ta da. Okay, you can spread that okay. out. It smells fantastic. Right. I mean, it hasn't even cooked yet. No, and it's then going to go into the oven on 375 to cook. And here is our finished product. Yes. It's a little warm, but there we go. Look at that. Now tell me it's everything you imagined. And so much more. And so much more. So oh, much more. and we have some wonderful side treats. I love it with cranberry. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then we have some giblet gravy. So, oh, look at that. There you go. Smell the corn. Mm -hmm. A little gravy on there. I'll have some of that out. Mm -hmm. Some pan brown gravy. Look at that. Where do you stand on your cranberry sauce? Do you like the canned or do you have to make it fresh? I have to make it. Mm -hmm. Well, because I have to put all kinds of things in it, you know. I mean, I like sometimes to have a little orange relish. Sometimes I want um, a pear um, and lots of brandy. <laughs> <laughs> a bourbon. Now, tell me what you think. Oh, that's good. To be or not to be. Oh, my. Hmm. That is an opera for the mouth. It's got a nice spice to it. Hmm. I mean, it's a meal. Right in itself. <laughs> my gosh. It's got protein, it's got carbs, it's got vegetables. This is a completely rounded meal. And it has bacon. That's the secret <laughs> ingredient. Mm. Whether it's dressing, stuffing, duffing, or stressing, this is fantastic. There you go. Mm. Yeah. What are you most thankful for? This? Grace. I have truly been blessed and gifted to continue doing uh, the things that I, I'm driven to do, that I have a passion for. Um, I'm excited that the work I do continues. I'm thankful for that. Well, we are thankful for you, for your contributions. This stuffing, dressing is fantastic. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm looking forward to just spending more time getting to see folks like you hanging out. Me too, Al. It is good to see you, Alexander Smalls. Thank you. Thank you for being part of Cooking Up a Storm. I've enjoyed it. Up a storm. <laughs> Ahead of the curve. <laughs>
Shepard for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. This is fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Listen now, wherever you get your... Check one, two, one, two, one, two. Oh, How you doing? Wait, what? No, don't do that, <laughs> wait, Hoda. How what? you doing today? Come on. You good? Come on, I got my dog ears going on. Hey, the book. come, come on. on. Dog ear in the book. Oh, the, are you enjoying it so far? Loving it. Oh, Sounds man. like it Thank was like so it's much. it was as if you just spoke and it all came out on the pages. It did. It, I, I mean, we're living crazy faith right now, so we're we're excited. I got to tell you, I am over the moon to be sitting with you. I'm over the moon to be making some space with you. Oh, this is awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I mean, me. first of all, welcome back to uh, the planet Earth. I know you shut that, <laughs> you shut your phone down. You you took a break from all things yeah. media, all Everything. things phone. Yeah. I mean, this is an important place, I think, to begin, Pastor, because so many of us are locked in. Tell me what your big revelation was by just this simple act of putting all phone social media away. Yeah, I think if I could sum it up in one word, the word is margin. And I, I think about like the greatest things I've ever did or ever done they came in the margin. It didn't come when I was trying to figure it out. It didn't come mm. when I was trying to make it happen. It came when I made space. And it's <laughs> so amazing that the title of this podcast has to do with making space. It's, it's I mean, when you look at my life story, um, when, I, when I've met you before, we were talking about uh, my last book, my first book, mm -hmm. Relationship Goals. It went number one New York Times bestseller, first book, crazy response, helping tons of people. But that message came when I came off of a month unplugged from all social media, you know, all internet, and it blew up. And I just feel like there's something that happens when you get revelation, when you get ideas, and when you get um, um, new thoughts, when there's margin. And so this year I did it um, bigger than I've ever done before. I took a, a hundred days and I was gone. I was out of here, we had a new what, baby. Can, wait, oh, I wanna hear about the babe, but can I just tell you <laughs> something? Some people would say, you know what would happen? If I took off from my whatever, I would lose my competitive edge. People no. would be sprinting past me. I took a break and I came back and the world went on without me and left me behind. That's false. And what it, it really does is it puts you on a trajectory of unhealth that one day you're going to look up and have all of these things and hate your life. See, what ends up happening is yeah. when you don't stop to enjoy what has happened, to be able to look at all of the amazing miracles that are your life to enjoy the children that you work so hard for when you do it you'll look up and you'll run on that motor for 20 30 40 years and then look up and not enjoy what you've built yeah you, you'll get off of this treadmill and be like i've been running so hard to go nowhere and what happens when you take a break or from my beliefs a sabbatical yeah. or a time of extended um um withdrawing I, I learned from the greatest leader I believe that ever lived was Jesus. When you just study him from a historical and a leadership um, standpoint, he's doing all of these miracles all around the world. But like after these feeding 5,000 and doing all of this stuff, it says, and he withdrew often. He withdrew. And I'm thinking about yeah. like, if you're like, claiming to be the son of God on the earth. Like, why in the world would you have to withdraw? Right. Like, why in the world would you have? But I believe there's something that happens in solitude that, that makes you humble. And for anybody that would say, like, you know what I'm saying, they passed me by and this yeah, and all that yeah. other stuff, you don't realize that each one of us come to this earth with a lane that we're supposed to run in. And it doesn't matter what anybody else is doing. What's for you is for you if you can stay healthy enough to run in that lane. And every time that I take this break or make space, what it does is it gives opportunity for me to recenter, for me to refocus and me to remember who I am, why I am, and who I'm created to help. You get messages. You said you don't when you don't seek it out, it comes to you. When you make yeah. space, it comes. How does it like? How does it come to you? How do the messages? How do you receive them? 
So something that's a practical practice for me every day is I have what I call quiet time where I do meditation, prayer, I read scriptures, and um, I write down the things that I feel strongly impressed on my heart. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's things like, go take your wife on a special date, like, and I just <laughs> feel like impressed to do that. And other times it's like, hey, pray for that family, or um, uh, go give to that person, or read this scripture over and over and over and over again. And I just follow those promptings. You know the crazy thing, Hoda, huh. is people aren't still enough or silent enough to even listen to themselves, to be able to see how they're feeling, to be able to see what what um, is being told to them by the people they love and by the, the, the things that are speaking to them. And when I make that space every day, mm -hmm. it's so crazy that one hour out of 24 hours yeah. can begin to set the trajectory for my life, my family, and miracles to happen in my life that um, really make me feel like, I'm just a part of something that's <laughs> way bigger than me. And I'm just grateful that I get to play a small part. You know what's funny? It's so funny you're saying this because lately in the mornings, I, I always write in, in a journal and usually it's gratitude journal, three things. But lately I've just been writing like what's on my heart. It's a conversation I'll have with God by myself in the morning. Yeah. And for me in the morning, I get up at, I'm a 3.30 a.m. get up person to get to work. But there's even space then, like yeah. that 20 minutes, because I try to carve it out. And yeah. sometimes that's all it is. And I'm wondering, like, what's a, what am I supposed to be doing today? How am I supposed to be of service? Then I, the next morning I'll reflect, I'll say, did I do, did I carry out those things that I felt like I should have that day? Yeah. But boy, and that's 20 minutes at 3.30 in the morning. That's Come it. On. That's that's what it was. And, and it, it doesn't matter yes. what the time is. It's that you set intention for that time. Yeah. And, and I think that's one thing that um, in today's society, we let media, social media, uh, our schedules, our mm -hmm. children, we, we're ran by all of the things and we have not taken charge and prioritized the things that actually help us be healthy and whole and present to the moment. And for me, that's hard for me to say, like I even saying this to you yeah. right now, I sound like a completely different person <laughs> than I was three years ago because I found that my motor of running and going and making things happen and grinding and all of these words we we have uh, um, idolized in 2021, yeah. you know what I'm saying? All of those things were coming from, and listen to me say this, okay. an unhealthy place from my childhood. Huh. And I was trying to outrun insignificance huh. and insecurity from something that was so long ago. And now it's the thing people look at me as like, man, that guy has a crazy, I mean, he, he's always going and everything works. And what I was really doing was running from pain. And it came out wow. looking like, so much drive, but it actually was a, a an unhealthy route that I was trying to so. um, compensate for. And so when I see people that are so driven and can't take a break and ha and think it's proud to have vacation days they didn't use in this year and all this other stuff, it's a telltale sign that there may be something unhealthy in the past that they're actually trying to work and run their way out of. Boy, that's very very That's loaded. profound. That's I want loaded. I need to sit in this. I need to make space for that comment. But you are so right because people are like, I only need five hours of sleep. I worked Saturdays. High five, high five. So one of the other things I love that you do that I try to steal because you have so <laughs> many good things. And I want to get into the background of your life, but I just want to get a couple of nuggets before we go there, which is Let's go. you set intentions for your yeah. relationship with your wife. Yeah. for your relationship with your kids, for your job. Okay, help me because I want to do this. So what? how do you do it? What are you doing? How are you improving your relationship with your kids, your wife, your job? What do you do? I think the first thing that you have to understand is when you say what you desire, 
Mm -hmm. it begins to move your life in that direction. And most people are scared to even say what they're hoping for. Mm -hmm. They're scared to even say like, you know what? I hope to be working a job that I have time for my family. Mm -hmm. Like they won't even say that. Mm -hmm. And what I've designed my life around is being voice activated, steeped in my faith. And that's why I wrote the book, Crazy mm -hmm. Faith. That's why I've, I've, I've started to try to give away the plays that I've used used. And so the first thing I did honestly is got a vision and wrote the vision down and made it plain. And, and I d believe that a lot of people- Give me an example. Give me an example. Okay. Like, like very basic. Like I will date my wife for the rest of my life. <laughs> I said that out loud, but it wasn't enough to say it. I had to write it down and I had to write it down to the point where it became written down in my calendar every week. So every Tuesday night, we have a babysitter, no matter what happens, and I am going to date my wife. We're going to go to the movies. We're going to go on a walk. We're going to go swimming. We're going to do something together because there's no way that I can commit my life to all of these other things and then, by the way, kind of make my wife fit into the picture. Mm -hmm. And when I wrote it down, when I said it out loud, when I let my intention be known and I put that vision down on paper, mm -hmm. it's been two and a half years and every week we've had a date night, mm -hmm. some weeks, twice. And me and her are closer today than we've ever been. That's my high school sweetheart. I met her when I was 15 years old and we've been married 11 years. We got four kids. We run a bunch of businesses together, but it did not happen by accident. Right. I do not let anybody come in between what I say and what I do so that I can get the end result that we're looking for. Did something, like a lot of people have problems in their marriages. Yours yeah. wasn't perfect either. Not no, at all. Nobody who I've ever spoken to has had a, had a perfect one. So did this intention come from, uh-oh, our relationship isn't working and unless we do something... Yes. Yeah, so our, our intentionality came from if you're married more than five years, you're not married to the same person you married. Mm -hmm. Like, and we got a, a revelation that you keep changing every five years. And I needed to relearn who she was, what she used to like. She didn't like anymore. Yeah. And so I would do certain things. And I was like, man, that used to really work. <laughs> like that used to really get you going. Like what, what happened? And so we made an intentionality that I am not going to pause your growth on the frame that I remember you as. Yeah. I'm going to keep learning you. And out of that, you know, I think it was we had two kids and our, our son, um, we found out he had autism. And when we talk about crazy faith, like I'm sitting here and I'm believing for a change in his diagnosis mm -hmm. and we're going to therapies and all this other stuff. And in the midst of all that, I realized that that situation changed me and my wife a bunch. Hmm. And we had to go into a level of intentionality and in making space for the new version of who we were hmm. to each other and fall in love with that person. And as we begin to do that, we like that person better than the one we married. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like we begin to understand like, man, I love you even more now because we've been through this together and because you're still here and because we can still laugh about that. And again, making space mm -hmm. made us love each other even more. And I don't know, I, I'm right after we get off this podcast, I'm gonna go find her. I'm missing <laughs> her right now. I, I need to give her a hug and a kiss right now. By the way, I think that what you said was so profound. The person who you're with now is a totally different person than you were with five years ago, although they still sleep on the same side of the bed. Yep. They still use the red toothbrush. They still do yep. what they've always done. They are different. And you're right. It is relearning. I've actually, it's funny. I've been having these conversations with Joel lately about this is who I am today. Yep. I used to enjoy doing that stuff, and now I'm this person. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news. All right, it just is. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends in today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, oh, oh. That's just cool. 
Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day Kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Today. Let's go. We're going to kick off the Pink Power and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Go! What's the best thing about being this age? You have nothing to prove because you already proved it. What does it feel like to be in a city that you love so much? I am humbly proud that I stuck up for my town. We all have the honor of helping reopen the doors. Broadway is back! This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're going to do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening, with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life in prime time and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. This is fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. Have you ever felt something from God and you thought to yourself, like, is this my gut or my soul talking, or is it God? Because I was wondering how do we, and I've wanted this just for myself, how do you figure out if it's your yeah. will or him? I have this chapter in the book called Maybe Faith. Okay. And I think it's my my favorite part of the book because people is like, how do you know it's God? How do you know it's the right thing? And most pastors won't tell you this, but I'll tell you very straight, you don't. Like you don't, you don't know at the starting line, is this God? It proves to be God. Uh -huh. And this is why I tell people I live my life at 51% faith. If, if, if I'm 51% mm -hmm. sure it's God, <laughs> I'm going for it. Okay. And because I have the heart to be able to be corrected, and I'm humble ah, enough good. to say, you know what? I missed that. That I thought that was it, but I, <laughs> hey, my bad guys really going on. And that's where... I, I've been able to see so many amazing things happen because some people stand at the starting line and is like, okay, how long is this going to take? How much is this going to cost? Are we going to win? Is this worth it? And they end up living their life paralyzed at a pause at the start. And what I do is it's very, I tell people this, I said, it's, it's a lot easier to direct the moving car than it is to, to direct or, or steer a car that's standing still. <laughs> that's and true. I really do believe that as you start making the step, like, I'm not sure that this is it, but I'm going to at least start looking up homes in this city. Yeah. As you make that step, then there's either confirmation or denials or checks or your peace is not there. And then you'll know, like, well, maybe I need to go back to prayer. Maybe I need to do something else. And as you live on maybe faith, like, maybe this is you. Yeah, yeah. I see so many good things happen, and um, it just takes being humble. Well, I do like that you talk about change because I think a lot of people say, whether they're in a relationship um, or friendships or whatever, like people are who they are. You either accept mm -hmm. them or you don't. People don't change. They can change around the edges. Mm -hmm. But in reality, that's who. That's how they were raised. That's the way they're going to be. What's What's your yeah, answer? I don't that? really believe that because I know who I am, mm -hmm. and I know who I was, mm -hmm. and I know who I'm. I'm trying to be. Hmm. I was a liar. I was a manipulator. I was somebody who was addicted to to pornography and hmm. wrong images, and I I had a lot of evil in my heart. I I I. I only looked out for myself. I was very selfish. Like that's who I was. Mm -hmm. it, it's was it wasn't what I presented, but that's who I was on the inside. Mm -hmm. And now today, I look at my life and how I give everything that uh, I have to help people, to serve other people, to make exceptions and uh, uh, allowances for people's faults and shortcomings. How I like that was not me like mm -hmm. I, I, like that was not me i i had a uh, a potential uh what was it called uh i had a case 
um, in court for car insurance fraud mm -hmm. and like all like I was a crazy guy. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I'm sitting here today and I am I am all about spreading a message of hope, uh -huh. love, faith and really helping people become their best versions. I know that transformation is real. I know that change is possible. And I am acutely aware of the grace that we all need to yeah. be able to make those decisions. D did your change, did your moment, did it come like a lightning bolt? Did your moment <laughs> of change come in baby steps and take years? Like Yeah. My, one of my greatest sayings, and if you come around our church, our organization, you'll hear this all the time. Progression, not perfection. Hmm. I think that this, if this could become people's mantra, they would be able to do so much more when they allow the little movement forward to be the win instead of this big, like you said, lightning bolt mm -hmm. moment. It wasn't that for me. It was like this year, I'm going to become better at listening and keeping my word. Hmm. And next year, I'm going to try to stop eating a, a gallon of ice cream every <laughs> night before I go to bed. And this year, I'm going to open my scriptures and I want to read at least 10 minutes a day. It, like, it just has been like baby progression, steps. baby steps, baby faith, just making moves. And I look up 10, 15 years later and it's like, you're a pastor of a church and you're talking <laughs> to hundreds of thousands of people weekly. And like, I'm like, who are you? Like, that's how I feel. Do you ever drift away from God? Ooh. Do you ever? <laughs> You talking big language right <laughs> here, right now. You used one of my trigger words, oh. drift. Oh. This year, our word for our church is anchored. Hmm. And we, we are trying to get anchored spiritually, emotionally, physically, like and, and it's in every area of our life. Mm -hmm. But the tagline is this is the year of the anti-drift. Oh. And the one thing about drifting, so you said drifting and it like went through <laughs> my whole body right there. Because um, drifting is natural if there's not intention. Say that again. That was good. Drifting is natural if there is no intention. Yes. yes. If you put a boat in water. There does not have to be a storm for that boat to drift. If you just put it there with no anchor, it's going to be out to sea in an hour and a half mm -hmm. because there was no intention of dropping an anchor somewhere. Mm -hmm. And yes, to answer your questions, there are tons of places in my life that I have drifted because I was not intentional. Mm -hmm. So one of those areas was in my health, very practically, the church is blowing up. I'm having all of these kids. And as the church is blowing up, I'm blowing up. Like I'm eating everything. I'm fat and happy. I'm, I'm eating ice cream. I'm doing all the different things. And this year, when we talk about anchored, I looked at myself and I was 264 pounds. I was completely out of shape, all of those different things. And in a quiet time, I really felt so strongly that this was an area that I had been drifting. Yeah. And I made a decision. That if, if I was shown something, I was going to start in crazy faith, making steps toward that. So we started eating better, got a trainer. Like I literally just finished working out. I'm, a hun I'm 229 pounds today. From, that was four months ago. And, and I'm 229 pounds, almost lost 35 pounds since I made the decision. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? Some late breaking news for hours into the Iowa caucuses. All right, it just fit too. Nearly a dozen hours 
ship, the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news. All right, it just is. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. We're going to kick off the Pink Power and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. What's the best thing about being this age? You have nothing to prove because you already proved it. What does it feel like to be in a city that you love so much? I am humbly proud that I stuck up for my town. We all have the honor of helping reopen the doors. Broadway is back! Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Just one last question because I want to hear a sermon right now. I feel like I wish I could hear one. But <laughs> but is there, is there, and I'm not going to, I don't want to pin you down right now in case you can't, sometimes you can't remember you've done so many great sermons, but was there one that really resonated with people in a way that surprised you? I mean, I know, I, could, I'm, I mean, I'm feeling like we're having one right now and we're just having a podcast, but but was there was there one that sort of sticks out in your mind that, if, that you could share with us for a little bit? Yeah, I, I think it would be the first message that I ever did of Crazy Faith. Um, I, I, I came off sabbatical, mm -hmm. like literally, this was my first message after being off for six weeks. And when I got up and spoke, I told people, I brought two chairs out on the stage. And one was a kitty chair mm -hmm. and one was like an adult chair. And I was telling them, I said, most of us don't have faith in situations, circumstances, and places if it doesn't look strong enough to hold us up. Mm -hmm. And I brought this big guy out on stage <laughs> and I said, which chair would you want to sit in? And he, of course, said the big chair. Yeah. And I said, what if I told you that the small chair was manufactured to hold you up? What if I told you this was God's will for your life? What if I told you that it can carry your weight? Which chair would you choose? And he said, I'd still choose the big chair. <laughs> and I said, doesn't this sound like many of our lives that we would rather choose the thing that looks good than the thing that was built for us? Hmm. The thing that, that really other people mm -hmm. would say it is not really the best for us, but the manufacturer or God tells you, like, I know this doesn't look like what you thought, but I want you to sit in it. I said, what if I sat in the chair? Then would you sit in it? And he was like, maybe. And so I sat in the kitty <laughs> chair, and we were about the same size. And I said, now would you sit in that chair? He said, I don't know. And I said, sit in the chair. I said, look how much time you've wasted being able to stand on your own when something was designed for you yeah. that looked different, yeah. but really was designed yeah. to hold up your weight. And then when that man sat down in the chair yeah. and it held him up like he was being cautious, <laughs> the whole uh, auditorium <laughs> began to shout and you know what I'm saying? The, and because it was a picture yes. of what so many of us are living. We're living this idealistic life. Like if God would give me this and my chair looked like that yeah. and I had this husband yes. and I had this job yeah. and I was able to work at this city and all this other stuff. And God said, no, this no. chair is different. It looks different. Yeah. It's not probably what you would have put, but I designed it specifically for you. Just for you. Would you have crazy faith and put your weight on it? See, the whole thing was he didn't care if somebody else put their weight on it. But yeah. faith is actually putting your own weight and believing and trusting that this thing will hold you up. And I don't know, somebody may be listening right now that has an idea of what you want your chair or your life to mm -hmm. look like. And God may have a different chair for you yeah. that you're going to have to step in crazy faith and put your weight on it. But when you put your weight on it, how much more exciting <laughs> is it to be in something that was manufactured for you, your life, your family, and I didn't know it was going to resonate with so many people, wow. but we put that up online and millions of people have watched that message. And um, 
just started living a life of crazy faith after that. Well, you are such a unique pastor. You're all by yourself. Wow. I mean, you help people with relationships. You talk about people, things that, that you don't expect a pastor to talk about. And I love that because Got it's, to. it's all part of us. This book, Crazy Faith, is beautiful. And I love the subtitle, It's Only Crazy Until It Happens. Michael Todd, man, what a blast. Thank you. Oh, we could do this once a week. Come Maybe on. we need to start the Mike and Hoda show. Dang we it. can, we can. Hey, listen, let's let, let's hey. let's do an hour uh, every week or every two weeks. Uh, let's look, do it. I'll be your sidekick any day <laughs> of the week. <laughs> Thank you, honey. I appreciate you. Oh, love Thank you. you so much. So um, at the time, I was living in Paris. I was just a couple months out of college, and I was working as a paralegal and pursuing this other, you know, stringer position on the side. And I hadn't been feeling well for a while. It started with an itch, and the itch blossomed into all kinds of mysterious symptoms. Mm -hmm. I was getting colds all the time and coming down with bouts of bronchitis. Uh, but the biggest symptom I had was fatigue. Mm. But of course, at 22, everyone is tired. Yeah. Everyone that I was hanging out with was working hard and going out at night dancing. And so I didn't really make much of it. And I went to see a number of doctors, all of whom you know treated that specific symptom or ailment right. and sent me home. And toward the end of my time in Paris, I started to get the feeling that my doctors that I was seeing weren't taking me seriously mm -hmm. but I think the truth is I wasn't entirely taking myself seriously mm. and it was only when I got to a point where I was so weak it was a struggle to walk up and down the stairs that I found myself in an emergency room and within 24 hours I was on a plane back home to wow. upstate New York and I got the bone marrow biopsy that led to my actual diagnosis to hear the words that you were diagnosed with a specific type of leukemia at 22 is scary enough, but when they said the chances of survival were one in three, I mean, my God, yeah. like what does a, what goes through a 22 year old's head? I think there was this immediate sense of fracture. There was my life before yeah. and everything that came after. And, you know, I never returned to Paris, to my apartment, to my job. Friends packed up my things and, and mm. sent them to my house. And I had this sense, even though I couldn't quite wrap my head around what it meant to have a cancer diagnosis at 22, that the person I'd been before was buried. There was mm. no returning. Mm. to that pre-diagnosis self. The cancer fight, and it, I don't know how y you describe it, but it usually there's a beginning and an end point for it. I mean, I had breast cancer, I think for six or eight months I went through stuff. Yeah. Your timing, the, the three and a half, was it three and a half, four years of going through chemo and bone marrow and chemo again, how did you see light? And how did you survive all those days? One of the most challenging parts of that experience was the sense of the goalposts moving. Mm -hmm. I didn't know, you know, on day one that I was going to be in treatment for three and a half years. And they say you can survive anything as long as you can see the end date yeah. in sight. And there came a point in my treatment where I couldn't see that end in sight. Mm. And that was the most challenging, I think, to know how to kind of anchor yourself when you're swimming in a sea of uncertainty. I mean, there are life lessons that come in your worst times. I mean, some change we, we choose in our life and some is cast upon us and mm -hmm. you have to figure it out. And I don't know, I remember so clearly how the world got clear. Like it, I was never clear. I think I was kind of always mushy about things. Mm -hmm. Those are my friends. I don't love that one so much, but so what? They're nice. I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. And then all of a sudden, you realize, like, 
my life has a beginning and an end and I'm not wasting time. Like that time is over. Yeah. Did you have that sensation? Yeah. I think like, you know, a lot of people in their early 20s, I had this feeling of time. Yes. I had time to figure out who I was, time to figure out what I wanted to do. And that diagnosis brought into immediate, urgent focus the fact that we're all here for a finite Mm -hmm. period of time. And I felt a strange sense of urgency around time. Mm -hmm. And I had the same experience. It felt like all the artifice just kind of fell away. Yeah, I got clear not only about who my friends were, but maybe more importantly, who I wanted to be friends with and what Mm -hmm. kind of relationships I wanted to cultivate. And I had such limited energy that I was well enough to maybe do three things every day, small Mm. things, like write an email, watch a movie, see a friend. And what that meant for me was that I had to get very clear about my priorities. Wow, that is so true. And there's something so strange about how free you feel suddenly. You didn't even realize you were carrying all that heavy junk around. It's like, I didn't even, you know, you don't even realize it. It's like my shoulders feel lighter, even Mm -hmm. though you're in the middle of it. So to have a doctor say to you after a bone marrow transplant and chemo again, okay, I don't know if he used the term cancer-free or mm-hmm. you are in remission, but to hear those words, what did, what did that moment feel like? Mm. I mean, I had been hoping to hear those words for almost three and a half years. The goal had always been to survive and I'd spent you know 1400 days working tirelessly oh, toward that goal and I thought when I got to that place I would want to celebrate yeah I wanted to feel grateful I wanted to quickly and organically fold back into the rhythms of living but instead I found myself in this kind of limbo this kind of in-between place where on paper I was better mm-hmm. But off paper, I couldn't have felt further from being the healthy, happy, you know, 27 year old that I'd hoped to be on the other side of all this. Especially because when you spend almost well, three and a half years in one space, the I, it's the same thing. The idea that, OK, now this is over and all your friends or some of your friends and colleagues are saying, oh, great. So now we can go back to the way it was. Let's go out to the bar. Let's go have some fun. Exactly. You weren't feeling those things. Yeah, I wanted to be you wanted to. Yeah. Things. But, you know, I think often when we talk about things like cancer, the kind of final act or the end of the story is comes with a cure. Uh, But we Mm -hmm. don't talk a lot about what happens after. Mm -hmm. And it took me a a while to even acknowledge to myself how much I was struggling. There were so many unanswered questions that I didn't know what to do with. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, how do I find a job when... I need to nap for four hours Mm -hmm. in the day or my immune system is still sending me to the emergency room on Mm -hmm. a regular basis. How do I date when I have a quarter inch of hair and a port still in my chest? How do I talk about, you know, the side effects of chemo, like infertility or early menopause? Like all of it felt so overwhelming. And in a weird way, I found myself almost wishing that I was still sick, not because I wanted to have leukemia, of course, but I understood the hospital ecosystem. Right. That was the world I lived in for four years. I felt comfortable there. I looked like the other patients. It was the outside world Mm -hmm. that felt scary and foreign and daunting to me. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. We're going to kick off the Pink Power and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. What's the best thing about being this age? You have nothing to prove, because you already proved it. What does it feel like to be in a city that you love so much? I am humbly proud that I stuck up for my town. We all have the honor of helping reopen the doors. Broadway is back! This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. 
Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends at Today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Shop today with Joe Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're going to do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening, with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life. In primetime and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. So I love your New York Times column. I thought it was so beautiful and riveting and moving. But what I loved so much more was when people reached out to you because they wanted, because they, they connected with you. You had mm. this way that whether you were sick before or you weren't, or you knew, somehow people felt you, like they, you reached across and you grabbed them by the heart. Mm. And people wrote you letters. And you know, in, in this industry, sometimes you get a letter and you got beautiful letters and you read them, but then you did something totally amazing. Like I have not, <laughs> I have not heard of someone doing this, but what did you do with those letters that you got? So, you know, in that year after I finished treatment, I was in the most lost place yeah. I've ever been. I knew I wasn't a cancer patient anymore. I knew I couldn't return to the person I'd been pre-diagnosis, but I had no idea who I was. And so I started thinking about these different rites of passages that we have in our culture, these kind of ritualized ceremonies that help us move through transitions mm -hmm. like baby showers and mm -hmm. weddings and funerals. And I realized that there wasn't a kind of ritual or rite of passage when you emerge from a long illness. Mm -hmm. And I needed that. I needed time to reckon with what I'd been through and to reflect on yeah. who I wanted to become. I needed the space away from my home and my kind of cancer identity to really kind of come into my own. And so I hatched this kind of boondoggle <laughs> of a plan and I decided to learn how to drive. You hadn't, you didn't have your license. I did not have my license. Mm -hmm. yeah. I rented out my apartment yeah. and I borrowed a friend's car and I ended up embarking on a 15,000 mile road trip across the country to meet some of the strangers who'd written me letters about their own major life interruptions mm. and their own stories of transition. And they really, you know, those individuals, there were about 22 of them that I visited, became my sort of breadcrumb trail through the wilderness of survivorship. Mm. I was always prepared for the other shoe to drop, uh. prepared for something to go wrong. And what I found instead in these encounters and on that road trip was that the world really welcomed me at mm. every turn. I ended up you know, staying on someone's fold out couch. I stayed on a ranch in Wyoming with a family of survivalist ranchers. I visited a high school teacher in California who was grieving the death of her son. I oh. went to uh, a maximum security prison in Texas to visit a death row convict. And each of those conversations helped me gain a sense of perspective mm. on my own predicament. But more than that, I think it showed me a way to reimagine community. And it gave me this sense of connection that at a time in my life when I felt so lost and so isolated, really helped me see a path forward. Are you happy? I'm so happy. <laughs> what, what makes you happy now? The strange thing in the last year of this pandemic is I found myself uh, living a, 
a version of the life that I had when I was sick, which mm. is to say that my circle is much smaller, smaller right. my life is quieter. And I don't know about you, but I have spent so much of the last decade striving and working and hustling. And I feel so privileged to get to do work that I love. Mm-hmm. But I've also been thinking about the way that, that working at that pace can be its own kind mm-hmm. of trauma response. Mm-hmm. So this year for me, my goal has been leisure. Uh, which isn't to say I'm not working all the time, you are. yeah. But you know these small moments that I've gotten to have in the last year of of being at home with our dogs, of gardening, of hanging out with my partner John. Of- you know, it's so interesting because I I sometimes think like life is full of exclamation points. It's like the good ones. You graduated from college. You meet a great guy. You have a baby. You get married. And then on the flip side, it's you get a sad diagnosis, somebody passes away, et cetera. But most of the days mm. are just Wednesday yeah. in the middle. Nothing terrific and nothing horrible, just Wednesday. Yeah. Something I've been thinking about recently is trying to approach my Wednesday as ritual, mm. washing the dishes as ritual, mm-hmm. gardening as ritual, and really trying to kind of slow down and, and savor that because it's so easy to move from one exclamation point to the next. But I'm sure as you know, you know, when you get a scary diagnosis, you're not thinking about the things that are on your resume. Mm-hmm. You're thinking about the people you love mm-hmm. and wanting to spend time with them you're thinking about the things that nourish you Mm -hmm. and yeah all the rest doesn't matter as much and it falls away you know we live in a country that has this culture uh, or this anxiety of around accomplishment Um, and in this season in my life I'm trying very hard um, to resist that and, and to kind of center myself back and those things that I love, the same things that I loved as a little girl, the dancing and music and, and writing and, and family. Speaking of music, music has always been a big part of your life. Music has always been a big part of my life. Which explains your very handsome and awesome boyfriend. <laughs> if you don't know John Baptiste, and we're going to bring him in here in just a second, but he's a cool cat, boy. Is he something special? He is. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. High forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. Didn't fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. People really don't know what's going to happen. Really a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. By the man who never did. All right, it just fits. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. High forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. Didn't fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're going to do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening, with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life in primetime 
and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. I'm sitting smack dab in the middle of a love story. <laughs> um, okay, so... You're 13 years old. You're both geeks. I know you are at 13 because nobody was not a geek at 13. Oh, yes. So are you guys close to the same age? Yeah, we're about a year and a half apart. A year and a half apart. Mm -hmm. So, uh, John, do you remember uh, your girl from band camp at age 13? <laughs> so here's what I remember. Uh-huh. I remember Birkenstocks. This is not an endorsement. You had Birkenstocks on before they were cool. Yeah. <laughs> she was ahead. Suleika was ahead. <laughs> now, and I also must say... I am, am honored to talk to you because when I was growing up at that time, I was watching you on WWL. Come on, uh, come on. <laughs> so when I was growing up in New Orleans, Kenton, Louisiana, uh -huh. you'd be on TV. My first time leaving was to go to this band camp. First time leaving <laughs> home and being somewhere for the summer. You go somewhere for the summer for the first time, it's like a new world. Yeah, where you, was band camp? Where were you? Saratoga Springs. Oh, so you took a big trip. This yes. was not a nothing. All oh. right. Upstate New York. So you were already, <laughs> what instrument were you playing, John, at the time? Piano. And I saw her in the courtyard. And this is, you know, again, I thought this was maybe a New York thing. People wear Birkenstocks. <laughs> Nobody was wearing that in New Orleans. <laughs> no, they weren't. Those were not cool in New Orleans. And I thought it, it would, what immediately came to my mind was, oh, she's like a, a hippie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like granola. Like <laughs> that vibe. Crunchy granola. <laughs> Uh, and how did you at 13 were you at what, did you have any confidence level at 13 or were you like a lot of 13 year old girls you did she did definitely I was what? a 13 year old definitely. going on 20 I thought I was far more mature than I actually was that's definitely. impressive most 13 year old girls feel so incredibly awkward I was just coming out of what I call UDS ugly duckling syndrome <laughs> I'd just gotten contacts for the first oh, time to replace my, uh -huh. my bottle definitely. thick glasses okay so now at 13 that's when the crushes start happening Did, was there a crush or was, were you all just friends no no, no crush yeah I would I was very much a uh, late bloomer. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I was into music and video games uh -huh. and martial arts and chess, <laughs> things like Eclectic. that. Eclectic, you got a nice array. Uh, uh, all the nerdy activities. <laughs> yeah. I was about to say all the introspective kind okay. of uh, introvert activities. Yeah. So you see. So like when you saw him, was did you just thought a, a, a nice kid, nice guy? <laughs> I remember thinking he was a little strange because I I think I tried to initiate a conversation and conversation was not happening. You were not into it. You just weren't a conversationalist then. I think there's a glorious awkwardness <laughs> in uh, coming into your own at that age. Yeah, and it's I think weird. I, it's it's strange, but a beautiful strange. And I feel like I've kept that until adulthood <laughs> but you know i still you know i feel like we probably tried to speak and at that time anybody who i talked to yeah and she's always been a great communicator yeah. always magnetic always yeah. able to communicate she's got it. the emotions that other people are feeling I, I noticed that about her immediately yeah um but there was no crush we 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 linked later in college and that's when we started to really become more friends you know what's weird mm -hmm. i am my First, my first week at Juilliard, I was on the one train with my friend Michelle, and I had no, you know, I hadn't thought about John since band camp several years earlier, which oh, when you're a teenager yeah. feels like yeah. a decade. <laughs> and I see this young man on the train who is singing to himself and playing the air piano. That's and nice. people were kind of staring because even in New York, that's not a sight that you see every day. And I looked at him and I turned to my friend and I said, that's John Batiste. What is he doing here? And I said, that's the man I'm going to marry someday. Wait, And I just wait, blurted wait, it out wait, and forgot stop about it. it. St I want to stop for a second. <laughs> On the one train, you knew you were going to marry John? It, it was like one of those things you just say, and I didn't think about it, and I didn't give it much weight. <laughs> so is that the last you see of her before you know she's not feeling well? No. Mm -hmm. we, we saw each other. This is in college, my yeah. first year, her last year of high school then she doesn't end up going to Julia. Right. she goes to Princeton then right. at Princeton she has this um, incredible time we don't see each other in passing we see each other at performances here and there right. we have mutual friends but we're not really as connected, connected. Yeah. then she has a going away party because she's moving 
you move into Paris. And I went to the going away party with a mutual friend of ours. Mm -hmm. But then that was when there was a, a spark at that party, the oh. going away party. But oh, she was going away. Going to Paris. So bye. That it was not you know oh, the time. You were pining, John, <laughs> a little, a little. You're pining we a had little. A, a, a moment. Uh -huh. We had a moment. Well, you got to have a moment. I mean, come on, going to Paris, y'all. There's love in the air. Yes. Okay, so let's fast forward to how did you learn that Suleika was was ill, was not well. So that same friend Michelle told me one day we. Um, were playing, you know, my band, we would play in public places often, mm -hmm. you know, for, not for money, just to bring mm -hmm. the music, revelry, mm -hmm. joy. Uh, we were playing in the subway one mm -hmm. day, and um, mm -hmm. she told me, and I gathered the rest of my band, because at this time it was just a few of us, mm -hmm. and I gathered the rest of them, and we went to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, I hadn't heard that she was that ill until that moment. Mm -hmm. It was a It was a real moment of clarity that I had to do something and what I do is music I just felt I needed to bring that to the situation to help in any way that I could so that's what I did but that must have been emotional because you didn't expect to, to see her in that way I, I, I guess there's an impact that a person has on you that you don't know the full extent of until you're in a moment of mm -hmm. crisis so it felt like I needed to do something in that moment even though we weren't super close friends it felt like oh i really connect with this person i respect this person what she's all about what i know of her this is this is important so that's why we went to the, the hospital we played and it was a beautiful experience did you feel like you were doing some good yes i, I felt like we were doing good but that's that was a, a special thing for our relationship a special time to to you know you see each other through these different phases and you see what a person is like when they're 13 14 then you see what a person is like at the beginning of college then you see what a person is like when they finish college and going out into the world then you see what a person is like when they're going through tremendous duress the impact of that on their life meeting the family understanding you know how that impacts a whole community but it's also <laughs> a testament to john because john is someone who who shows up in the difficult moments and who keeps on showing up, not just for me, but for everybody. Mm. Um, and he's always been that way. <laughs> well, I, you, you, you gotta show him. <laughs> you gotta show people you love them. Mm -hmm. I, I urge everybody out there, you show the person in your life who you haven't told, or you haven't shown your love, show them. So what's, uh, what's the future with you two? Well, you, we were talking about the uh, the kids mm -hmm. you, that 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 you have in your life that's a beautiful thing to have family we uh, we look forward to something in that realm you know there's complications yeah um, you know I don't I, I don't I don't feel like that is ever a barrier to no. family because you it's can not. you can plenty figure of ways out. to make mm -hmm. a family right yeah I, I think it's possible it's it's all about love well and I'll just say. Like, I think one of my big anxieties coming out of this illness was finding a partner who understood that mm -hmm. and who wasn't sort of scared of having hard conversations or awkward mm -hmm. conversations around things. Um, and I remember talking to John about infertility early on mm -hmm. uh, as a result of my treatment. And he said, there are many ways to make a family mm -hmm. and it's its own kind of creative act. And you've just been understanding and, and open in a way that I wish were the norm, um, wow. but that I feel very grateful for. Is she's got to be real. Come on. She's a very real person. By the way. Eloquent, but she can say <laughs> she's real. So you, it's easy to have real, authentic conversations. Well, you know, I think John is one of the most creatively brilliant people I know, but what I've loved observing and learning from is the way creativity informs every aspect of his life, including our relationship. Mm. And so one example of that is we both travel a lot for work in non-pandemic times. And because of that, have to spend sometimes several weeks apart. And he came up with this idea early on in our relationship, which was to write each other a letter mm. every day. 
by hand. Instead of doing like your morning morning pages or writing in a journal, he would write a letter by hand, take a photo of it and text it to me. And it I brought me that. back to those letters <gasps> that I got on the road trip. Oh, wow. And mm. I think that there's sometimes certain things that you can only say in the written word that you don't even maybe know you need to say that come out when you're writing letters. Um, but you're always doing stuff like that. You're always finding creative ways for mm. us to deepen our relationship and to stay connected. By the way, that is the most beautiful and thoughtful and smart. I was thinking, write a letter, but how are you ever going to get it? You take a picture and text it so you can actually read the handwriting. Brilliant. Right? <laughs> Joel and I are stealing that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you, it's so beautiful because watching your story from the beginning unfold, and I've been, I've been reading and watching a lot leading up to this interview, and sitting here in this moment and looking at you two is so beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Love is in the air, baby. Oh. Yes. <laughs> All right, Suleika, John, thank you guys so much. We appreciate you being on Making Space. As always, thank you for joining us on Today All Day. It is time for another fun-filled edition of Pop Start Plus. And today we got a good one. We're catching up with our buddy, pop sensation Ed Sheeran, who's got a great new album out called Equals. And later, Christina Elmore, star of the hit show Insecure, gives us a sneak peek at what to expect from its fifth and final season. But first, of course, let's get to our Pop Start headlines. Let's get started. Sex in the City's up first, and the world, of course, anxiously awaiting to see uh, what's next for Carrie Bradshaw in the upcoming HBO series. And just like that, Sarah Jessica Parker giving two lucky fans the chance to live like her beloved character for one night only. Carrie's <laughs> famously unrealistic yet glamorous <laughs> Manhattan Brownstone apart apartment is headed to Airbnb. Ooh, the what? space will be available for two one-night stays on November 12th and 13th. That's next week. That's next week. And in honor of it being 23 years since the original show premiered, the price tag is only 23 bucks. Wow. wow. Not a bad deal for a stay in the recreated Upper East Side studio, complete with Carrie's gigantic walk-in closet. And the lucky renters will also receive a custom greeting from Sarah Jessica Parker herself. Booking for Carrie Bradshaw's apartment opens up on <laughs> Airbnb. Aren't you grabbing your phones? Because I know, that's so cute. On November 8th. It's going to last one second. It's I know. It's going to be oh, yeah. on like 23 that. 23 bucks. Mm -hmm. Done. Next up, Jay-Z, the legendary rapper and business mogul, is sharing some words of wisdom in a new interview with possibly the world's most adorable reporter, 11-year-old Jazlyn, a.k.a. Jazzy's World TV, is a Brooklyn-based kid reporter who, really, who recently caught up with Jay-Z and asked him about the secrets to his success. To all the kids that have dreams of being successful like you, what advice could you give them? Be successful like me? Mm -hmm. Okay, believe in yourself, even if anyone else believes in you. You got that ultimate confidence like you do. You're very confident. Yeah. And just, just believe in yourself. We should oh, have her. Right. Oh. Looks like Jazzy's already on the right path to yeah. success. Mm. Horrible. Next up, Sing 2. This movie's supposed to be great, man. Yeah. 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 We, we have uh, an exclusive announcement on the upcoming animated sequel. Universal Pictures and Illumination will be releasing Sing 2 one month ahead of its <laughs> wow. scheduled premiere date Ooh. in over a thousand theaters across the country. Wow. And in honor of these exciting sneak previews, we have a sneak peek at a brand new trailer that is packed with an all-star cast of voices, including Matthew McConaughey, Scarlett Johansson, of course, Taron Edgerton, and even Halsey, just to name a few. Yeah. Oh. Dream big dreams. We just gotta be brave now. Wrong again! To say we, we were watching Frozen 2 in the house right now yeah. for girls, and it's, yeah. it's good, great movie. Yeah. But it's no Frozen 1, like no. Frozen yeah. was so Different. special. Well, let me tell Sing you something. Sing 2 made me nervous because no. Sing is one of my favorite movies, even as, as an animated film of all time, and I'm worried about Sing 2, no. but I'm hearing what it's incredible. Think? You're gonna love it. I got to have a little sneak preview yeah. with oh. a bunch of kids and moms. Yeah. Yeah. The moms, the kids, everyone was standing up cheering, Stop. singing, oh, dancing great. in their seats. It's nice. so good. Nice. I've never loved a kids movie as much as I well, love it. Well, it's not to come out until December, but you get to sing too. It's going to come out now on Saturday, uh, November 27th. The film hits theaters nationwide on the 22nd of December. For more information, you can head to today.com. Calm. And finally, we'll wrap things up with Michael Bublé. It All is right. time to break out the memes because <laughs> the King of Christmas is back with a brand new music video for a good one. one of his biggest holiday hits. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. 
It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas Everywhere you go There's a tree in the Grand Hotel One in the park as well It's the sturdy kind that doesn't mind the snow <laughs> it's like liquid velvet. I mean, as I walk in, it's just another reminder of the empathy I feel for poor Thanksgiving. <laughs> Always because forgot. We just went from Halloween. Everything's Christmas. Got, yeah. We've got to get. We've got to make it. a thing. Bublé dropped that uh, new video on Facebook yesterday. He hopped on Instagram Live after that. He's gearing up to release a new album. Oh, he said oh, on that Instagram Live. So we're looking forward to hearing more from our friend Mr. Mm. Bublé. And of course, it wouldn't be Pop Star Plus without some extra news. First up, Jay Leno on Wednesday, the veteran comedian stepped back into the role of talk show host to fill in on Kelly Clarkson's daytime show. And looking ahead to Thanksgiving, Leno shared a funny story from his childhood most of us can all relate to, a moment when his mom had enough of everybody's nonsense and absolutely lost it all at the dinner table. So she's getting ready for Thanksgiving, you know, up at 5.30, basting the turkey and candied yams and making the stuffy and uh, stuffing and lasagna. My mom would make her own pasta and then cut it. Now my mom comes in carrying this 21 pound turkey and her big sweat stains under her arms. And she, says, and she puts the turkey in front of my dad and she, give my, she gives my dad the electric knife. Do you remember those stupid things? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so my dad takes the electric knife and goes click, click, and he goes, it's not plugged in. Do I have to do everything in this house? Well, that was the wrong thing to say. I had no idea turkeys could fly. Literally across the room. Thanksgiving lasagna actually sounds better to me than the normal turkey. Thanks, Jay, we appreciate you. And finally, ACDC, the legendary rock group, has officially entered YouTube's Billion Views Club. They join just a handful of musical groups and artists who've had music videos with over one billion streams on the site. And with, they've got so many hits, You Shook Me All Night Long, Back in Black, Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap, and can you guess which one of ACDC's hit songs hit the big milestone? Here it is. Oh, it's one of my favorites. I, I, I didn't see that one coming as being the song that did it, but that's it. Thunderstruck off the 1990 album, The Razor's Edge, rocked past the billion viewer mark. One more way in which ACDC continue to be rock and roll trailblazers. We salute you, gentlemen. And those are the headlines for today. After the break, our visit with the one and only Ed Sheeran. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. All right, it just me too. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. And welcome back to Pop Star Plus. Ed Sheeran just released what he calls his favorite album yet, Equals. It's been four years in the making, and he gave us the inside scoop. He has the highest grossing tour, listen to this, of any artist ever. He's the second most streamed <laughs> artist on Spotify, and this week he is celebrating the release of his new album, Equals. It is a very deeply personal record, and according to Ed himself, his favorite album that he has ever written. And right now he joins us live from London. Eddie, good to see you, buddy. I know Hi, about a week before Halloween, you got the COVID-19 diagnosis. You've been in quarantine, but you're about to pop on a plane to get out here for SNL. How are you feeling? 
Yeah, yeah, I'm all right, man. Thank you for letting me on the show as well. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm meant to be there in person today, but obviously, um, I had the quarantine and everything. I got out, yeah, yes, tested for five days, and yeah, all's all good. Well, good. we we love it when you come here. So please come another time because you're one of our absolute favorite guests. Ed, um, so excited about this new record coming out. We already know a couple of the songs, and I just read this morning that actually Bad Habits was like a late ad, and now it's this huge hit. Yeah, well, I, I mean, Shape of You was like that as well. I, I, I find that sometimes when you finish an album, uh, the pressure sort of stops. So that's always the best time to try and write a song when you're not trying to write the first single. So uh, <laughs> I finished the album in like December last year. And then in January, I went in and just threw paint at a wall and saw what stuck. Yeah, that was uh, that was we, we, we rented an old country house in uh, oh, cool. Suffolk and set up a studio in it. Ed, obviously that record is a coming-of-age album for you, exploring fatherhood, exploring being married, explore, also exploring, uh, experiencing loss. I was I'm dying to hear this record, as you well know. Uh, we've been friends for many years. And I have to say, you lost a very good friend um, on March 2nd. Three weeks later, at St. Stephen's Church in London, you performed at Michael Godinsky's funeral. And you did a song. When I saw the recording of it, I, it was the most moving thing I've seen since maybe Buckley doing ho uh, Cohen's Hallelujah. Um, Visiting Hours is not only on the record, but you put sort of the, the strength and the, the tonality of this record on this one song's back by making it your first release. Tell me about that song and how it signifies this record. Um, well, I mean, the album itself, uh, like I've never really felt like an adult before. I've kind of, I went into my 20s as a, as a touring musician and I just toured the world and partied and whatever. And then I stopped touring uh, got married, had a kid, then my friend passed away and I turned 30. And all of these things sort of led me to sort of be, be an adult for the first time. And that's what I feel like the album's about. But the song itself, Visiting Hours, is I find like grief is something that everyone goes through and acceptance is like the last stage of it. And I'm not saying that I'm not saying like I haven't accepted it, but with Visiting Hours is like I, you just want five minutes with that person just because... Mm -hmm. You, you, you just want to be able to clear the air a bit before, um, yeah, accepting. Well, it's a beautiful song. And as you said, you've been through pretty much all of the life journeys in, in this short, short period of time, including a joy, which is fatherhood. And you have a really sweet lullaby that's uh, devoted to your little daughter. How's she doing? And how, how are you doing as a daddy? Yeah, good, good. It's definitely the best thing that's ever happened to me. It's, uh, uh, yeah, she's she's wonderful. She started walking. Uh, she's making, so I think she said pasta the other day. I think. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Um, but, yeah, she's, um, mate, she's great. She's great. And, um, yeah, we're definitely, we're new parents, so everything is, uh, we're learning. We're learning. And, um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, what it's, was, it's, it's, a, it's a journey. What was Lila for Halloween? Uh she was locked in with me actually she so my wife was away when i got my covid diagnosis oh, but okay. i had lyra so i was basically um i was in the house with her we did carve pumpkins and uh we did what well she didn't watch ghostbusters but i did put ghostbusters on after she'd gone to bed <laughs> yeah it's not good for a one-year-old how about um your your collab is that what Very the kids good. say your Very collab good. with taylor swift because people are pretty fired We're up about that. that next week yeah yeah, it's, well, so there's two of them, actually. There's two. So when I first met Taylor, the very, very first day, we wrote a song called Run, and uh, that was going to be on Red. And then we wrote Everything Has Changed maybe like a week later, which is the song that ended up being on on, on Red. So uh, um, Run was just always a voice note that I had, and I was always like, maybe one day she'll want to release it. And then when she was doing her re-releases of uh, the Taylor's versions of the album, she got in contact, said, obviously we should do everything has changed but how would you feel about doing run and um yeah it was a real joy to do real real joy to do and get, getting to revisit you know because it's been 10 years since we wrote those songs so right. it's a real uh joy to go and revisit them re-record them and it was so fun yeah. so, that is fun. Cool. so hey, that's Ed, how, uh, november 12th um uh, we'll get it on the 12th quickly we have the piece of videotape that we stumbled upon of you i guess auditioning for a british tv show that you did not get but let's just go ahead and roll you were that 16. down. 16. Yeah, 16. Ed hasn't a clue what he's doing, but he's trying. I'm just trying to really get it in my head. I think I messed up as well. I got kicked in the face by accident. They thought you had a lot of talent, Ed, um, but not in, in the dancing areas. department. Right. But I, I believe Maybe. her... 
the, the, so that that TV show was. Um, I thought that was like the end of my career when when I did it because it, it was it put so much pressure on you in in the moment. And they're like, it, you have to get this part. You have to get this part. If you don't get this part, this is the end. And I remember it, not getting it and being sixteen and being like, well, that's it. And uh, I because I wanted to be an actor, and that that was a it was like a England's High School Musical basically. Um, and uh, at that point, I said, right, I'm not going to be an actor. But I'm going to put full steam, all my energy into music, and I'm I'm so glad that I didn't get the part. Well, I was going to say, Ed, you might have thought your career was over. The only person who feels worse is Arlene, who turned you down, yeah. and she has a little message for you. Take a look. Oh. Hi, I'm Arlene Phillips, the woman who let Ed Sheeran slip through her fingers. I did say he couldn't dance, and I recently saw him dance a duet. And yeah, he can dance. <laughs> but Ed, I love and adore you, and I live for your music. Oh, How about that? Do you know, um, she wasn't lying when she said I couldn't dance. I wonder we saw. <laughs> yeah, no. Like, I don't, you know, when, when people say, oh, like, how do you feel about her saying you couldn't dance? Like, I'm like... She was totally honest. Um, but I did learn to dance with the Think Out Loud video, video and I, I actually bumped into her um, uh, just after that video came out, and we had a, we had a lovely chat. That's so funny. That's like okay. interviewing the coach who cut Michael Jordan. I know. He was in high school basketball. Uh, Ed, and you learned a lot when you were 16, and we got that valuable wisdom when you were our mega mentor on The Voice this year. So uh, on behalf of Ariana and Blake and John and Kelly, thanks for doing that for us. You were a real incredible addition to the show. We appreciate it. Thanks, man. It was so fun doing uh, The Voice. I think, like, uh, what what I love about it is every, everyone who's at the stage of that sort of knockouts is all so good. So it's less about them winning the whole thing and more about them just having the platform of the show to kind of go on and, um, yeah, be massive. So it's good. Well, thanks for being on. And good luck on SNL this weekend. Have a safe trip here. We're all going to be watching. Equals is out now. We encourage people to pick that fantastic record up as well. Eddie, good to see you, buddy. Appreciate Ed. Enjoy him on SNL, by the way. Coming up, our sit down with Insecure star, Christina Elmore. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go! International Day of the Girl! The strength and courage of these women is remarkable. What's your message to girls who want to make a difference? Believe in yourself. You can make it happen. News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're going to do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life. In primetime and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. After five seasons, it's almost time to say goodbye to the hit HBO show Insecure. Now, Christina Elmore loved the show even before joining the cast, and she told us why Insecure is so popular. So I was a huge fan of Insecure. I think what I loved most about it was that it was a show with women who looked and acted like me and who lived in my neighborhood. I literally live in South LA. I live in Inglewood now. And it was being shot all over my neighborhood. And it was about regular, regular women. It wasn't about like some superheroes or magical forces or like, I don't know, people trying to villains or taking down the government or drug dealers. It was just 
women who looked and acted and talked like me. Um, and so now to be a part of it is just, ah! No. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Should we go over our checklist? Check me. Okay, AV. My check. Seating. Chairs on check. Food. Tacos on deck. Alcohol. Bars on wick. Okay, then we're all set. Ooh. <laughs> So uh, the audition process for Secure was the craziest audition process I've ever been a part of in my life. Um, it started out normal. I got a breakdown for from my agent saying, okay, here is this audition you have tomorrow. And it was for some woman who I, I, I could tell from the script was going to be some sort of friend or mentor to Issa. I thought she'd be in it for the two episodes that I saw um, and had no idea that the character would go on and sort of do what she does. A month later, <laughs> I get a call saying, you're going to have a call back. And they said, it's going to be a chemistry read with Jay Ellis, who plays Lawrence. And so then I got there and the audition was in the evening. We're told, okay, whoever gets the role tonight is going to start tomorrow morning at 5.30 a.m. So you'll have a fitting tonight. You'll be back here in a few hours. And we were like, what? And so the way they did it was that as you came out of your audition, you some people were told to go home. Some people were told to go sit in the lobby. Some people were told to go to some other room. And it was like, you get a rose. You don't get a rose. <laughs> no one knew what was happening. And hours later, there's three of us sitting in a room and we're called out individually. Um, and I was the last person sitting in the room. And I then they said, okay, you're Condola. Um, we'll see you tomorrow. I am. Um... I gotta admit, I thought maybe I scared you away when I told you I was divorced. No. Oh. Oh. I would describe Condola as, I usually describe her as the adult in the room. She's trying to make the best decision for herself that she can. And often that looks like helping others and sometimes it looks like making a big decision on her own that um, will affect other people in ways they might not like, but that feels true and authentic for her. So I think she's really mature in that she tries to do what she thinks is right. Um, and she's also pretty fashionable and cute while she's doing it and kind. And I really love her, even though the rest of the world hates her. <laughs> I think my favorite part of playing Condola is that she's unlike anyone else I've gotten to play so far in my career. Um, I just like that she feels so much like me or the me I want to be in my head. But Condola feels like, oh, this is my girl. I know her. I feel like I know her psyche. I get her. I get her decision making and her process. Um, and I just love that we first meet her um, trying to help Issa out and being available to be a mentor and a friend. Um, and though later she might blow some things up, uh, we meet her trying to be a useful resource for Issa, even when she finds out she's in this sort of messy situation. And I love that about her. Condola came over last night. She needed to talk. Okay, about what? I'm pregnant. Oh, I'm Team Ethan and Lawrence. I always have been. I, okay, I'm not like a member of the Lawrence Hive. No, I'm not. Um, because I think Lawrence, for much of the show, was pretty shiftless and didn't have no direction, and I didn't want him for her. But now that he's gotten himself together, I'm definitely Team Issa and Lawrence. I do want him to be a good daddy, though, whatever that looks like. <laughs> so I think this season we meet Condola at a really sort of, like, tender and vulnerable time of life. Um, I think from the trailer, I can just say that she's just had a baby. Um, and we know that that baby came out of a relationship that was already done. Um, so we meet Condola on a spot that's pretty tricky um, to navigate for any woman, and especially her. <laughs> it, it was pretty tough in some ways playing someone who got that much backlash after what I thought was a really beautiful season. I just didn't expect it. I knew that people would be like, oh, I can't believe a baby's about to come and mess up this whole, you know, reunion of love. But I didn't know that they would sort of blame Condola. I just never saw that coming because it really takes two to tango. And ain't nobody mad at Lawrence. So it's confusing. Um, but it was also pretty fun because I've never worked on a show before where it's so much part of like the cultural zeitgeist and like Twitter and um, so it was fun. I laugh at all the memes. I love all the names for Condola. Some people went a little too far, but mostly it's been fun. <laughs> Working with this, I mean, incredible, so talented, so brilliant cast has been like a dream. 
I don't ever go to work thinking, oh God, I got to do a scene with this person. Oh, I wonder how that's going to go. There's just not a question. I know that it's going to be fun. I know that it's, they're going to be beyond professional and that I'm going to learn something. And Jay Ellis is, I do most of my work with him um, and he's become a brother and a friend in a way that I couldn't have expected. And I just find him to be so talented and wonderful and giving. And I feel so grateful. Who died? Jada? Yeah. No, she's alive. Oh. Cadella, hey! Hey! We were just uh, making jokes about movies. Oh. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> I think that the reason Insecure has been so revolutionary and relatable is really simple. I think that it has shown us back to ourselves, Black people who look like us, talk like especially for an older millennial, who look like us, talk like us, and who are living a normal, regular life. And it's so surprising that that is revolutionary in and of itself that we had not seen for so long Black characters in this authentic sort of real way that weren't having to do like a little wink to the audience or like a ba dum bum And that we just saw sort of an authentic portrayal that was hilarious, but not with a bunch of like canned laughter. I, I think in its simplicity, in its authenticity is what made it revolutionary. Um, and I think it's changed the landscape of TV. So we have more and more of these kinds of stories. And I'm so grateful. You can catch the final season of Insecure Sunday nights on HBO. Next up, we're throwing it back this Thursday with our buddy Matthew McConaughey. Stay with us. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. We're going to kick off the Pink Power and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. What's the best thing about being this age? You have nothing to prove because you already proved it. What does it feel like to be in a city that you love so much? I am humbly proud that I stuck up for my town. We all have the honor of helping reopen the doors. Broadway is back! This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Today is Matthew McConaughey's 52nd birthday. And to celebrate, we dug up a Today conversation with him going all the way back to 1999. Check out today's From the Vault. Good morning. Good morning, Katie. All right, so what is EdTV? Explain the concept to us. EdTV is, um, say if you went to anywhere in America, picked any family in America, and you picked one person out of that family and said, we want to follow you in your life 24 hours a day, no matter what you're doing. So I think most people would go, well, okay, sure. They would? Plus, uh, plus I'm good. okay, plus you're going to get a whole bunch of money. Oh, okay, well, in that case, money. you're right. Yeah, you're going to get enough money to make a living off. There's more money than you're making now. Now, when that happens, uh, there's a few things that each of us probably do and our families probably do that we take for granted that we don't really think are that, uh, that weird or that... Uh, um, that we probably Should don't be think available they, for public consumption. Yeah, we perhaps. probably don't notice it <laughs> yeah. until it's put under the microscope of, of a television. Does the presence of the camera make Ed change how he interacts with with people in his life? No, not really. No, it doesn't. Not, not too much. But if you think about what the camera's going to catch, and just think about your natural interaction with everything you do, there's a few things you probably. 2%, you probably don't want the camera to catch. You know? At least. It's that 2% <laughs> or that however much that is that uh, that really serves for the comedy in this film. Brush my teeth. And Woody Harrelson and you had a good time. Yes. You're both from Texas. You look quite alike Rayford. in this movie, yeah. right? Hey, trust me, this is my business. What, what is? Show business. Oh, you're in show business now. 
Yeah, I service video equipment. <laughs> it's like saying those people stitching Nikes in Panama are in the NBA. Hello. Bed wetter, dumb sucker. We hit it off. It took us an hour and a half, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we couldn't shut up. And then we were finishing each other's sentences. And ever since, we've been we we hang out every every chance we get. Yeah. Meanwhile. Did you take any of the lessons that you learned about fame? You know, you, you came on the scene in A Time to Kill and uh, really were catapulted into this it guy on the covers of all these magazines and Matthew McConaughey, blah, blah, blah. You were the guy. Um, right. And, and, and I, th I think that does some funny things to your head. It must. I mean, did you take any of sort of the life lessons that you've learned into this movie? There's some similarities, I mean, in that general kind of track with the character of Ed, but... And then, I mean, and Ron and I sat down and I tried to track about what was it like the first time I'm walking in the supermarket aisle and going to check out and I see myself on the cover of a magazine, which was the first time I saw that. And I mean, I was like, oh, okay. The song, you know, on the cover of a magazine kind of came in my head and I was like, look at this, and I, and I think I'll buy that. Well, a huge happy birthday going out to our buddy, Matthew McConaughey. That's going to wrap up today's Popstar Plus. Hey, we hope to see you again right here tomorrow. Have a happy Thursday. See you soon. Hello out there in today all day world. Thank you for joining us. And look who we've got. Chanel Jones, well, guest hello. appearance. Four letters for you, friend. Okay. TGIF. Ah, that's right, Savannah. Fry, yay. Our favorite day of the week. You are at home watching our digital show, Today in 30, a bite-sized portion of everything you love about today. I like to think of it as an energy bar with mm. everything you need. We'll get things started with a promising new pill to treat COVID, plus a battle erupting over new vaccine mandates for private businesses, impacting tens of millions of Americans. We're going to have complete coverage of that. Speaking of COVID, star quarterback Aaron Rodgers is under fire after he tested positive. The NFL now investigating to see if he and the Packers have been violating the league's COVID rules. More on that just ahead. Then our inside look at a surprising potential treatment for PTSD, the drug known as MDMA, or some remember it as ecstasy or molly, why the FDA is labeling this therapy a breakthrough, and the people who've tried it and say it changed their lives. Mm, and if you've worked hard all week and deserve to spend some quality time on the couch, maybe you want to watch something good. So we put together a weekend hit list with all the shows and movies you need to see. Oh, I love that. Doesn't that sound great? Yeah, do you think yeah. Today in 30 made the list? Ah, it you'll, should. You'll just have to wait and see. So let's get this show started right now. It's time for Today, Today in 30. 30. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez has got the details on all of it for us. Hi, Gabe. Good morning. Savannah, good morning. The rush is on to vaccinate younger children ages 5 through 11 at mobile vaccination sites like this one. And there are also big developments on multiple fronts regarding COVID. More states now say that they plan to sue the Biden over Biden administration over that sweeping COVID vaccine mandate involving many private employers. And now, as you mentioned, some encouraging news on a possible COVID treatment. This morning, Pfizer says its new antiviral COVID pill taken within three days of symptoms reduced the risk of hospitalization or death by 89% in high-risk adults compared to a placebo. The company plans to apply for emergency use authorization as soon as possible. Meanwhile, Britain has become the first country to approve another COVID antiviral pill developed by Merck. The FDA will consider that later this month. It all comes as the Biden administration is launching a sweeping COVID vaccine mandate affecting 84 million people, two-thirds of the U.S. workforce. It requires companies with 100 or more employees to ensure they're either fully vaccinated against COVID by January 4th or tested weekly. Marty Walsh is the U.S. Labor Secretary. Why is it employers of just over 100 people? We thought to ourselves about what employers have the infrastructure to be able to handle something like that. Fines administered by OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, could reach nearly $14,000 per violation. Several GOP-led states are already planning to sue. In Houston, this supply chain logistics company is concerned about employees leaving because of the mandate in an already tight labor market. What's going on out there in many ways is a culture war, and this mandate puts employers, many of whom aren't very well equipped to deal with it, right in the middle of that culture war. All done. That debate comes as a rollout of a COVID vaccine for kids 5 to 11 years old is ramping up. That was not hard at all. <laughs>
In Chicago, six-year-old Amelia Ateca was one of the first children in the country to test positive for COVID last year, spending days on a ventilator. Now, she's finally vaccinated. It's going to benefit you. It's going to benefit your child. It's going to benefit your neighbor. Okay. Gabe, let's go back to this news this morning, the Pfizer pill. How soon could it become available to the public if the FDA approves it? Well, Savannah, uh, once again, Pfizer plans to, says it plans to submit uh, its results uh, to uh, the FDA for emergency use authorization as soon as possible. Its study involved more than 1,200 adults taking a pill twice a day over five days. But separately, Merck is also set to be considering, uh, the FDA advisory panel is set to be considering uh, Merck's uh, pill later on this month. So Savannah, it could be weeks before some type of COVID treatment similar to Tamiflu becomes available. Savannah? Yeah, that'd be a breakthrough for sure, Gabe. Thank you. Also this morning, a high-profile COVID case in the NFL. Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers testing positive, and now that's led the lead to launch an investigation while Rodgers' teammates prepare to play without their big star. NBC Stephanie Goss joins us with the story. Hi, Steph. Good morning. Hi. Good morning, guys. This is a big game on Sunday for Green Bay going up against the Kansas City Chiefs. It was going to be tough even with Aaron Rodgers under, under center, but he's out after testing positive for COVID. Now the NFL says it wants to know if the Packers and Rodgers himself followed COVID rules, which are different depending on vaccination status. Halloween night, an unmasked Aaron Rodgers in costume at a party. Now he's sidelined for Sunday's big game against the Kansas City Chiefs because of a positive COVID test. Many wondering if Green Bay's star quarterback also broke the NFL's COVID rules. Unvaccinated players are not allowed to socialize with more than three of their teammates. Rodgers has not publicly said whether or not he's vaccinated, but he did suggest he was with these comments in August. Are you vaccinated and what's your stance on, on vaccinations? Yeah, I've been immunized. You know, there's guys on the team that haven't been vaccinated. Uh, I think it's a personal decision. I'm not going to judge those guys. Rogers has had no comment since his positive test. He's now in quarantine for at least 10 days. The quarantine only mandatory for unvaccinated players. Vaccinated players can get out of it with two negative tests a day apart, leading to some withering criticism in the sports talk world. Aaron Rodgers is a liar. Period. He lied through his teeth with a smirk on his face. The NFL says it will be reviewing what happened with Rodgers and the team, which has had several positive COVID cases. The NFL mandates that every team have cameras in every meeting room and around their practice facilities and stadiums. While vaccinated players have few rules this season, those who opt out of the shot have to follow protocols similar to last year. Daily tests, masks inside team facilities, and travel restrictions among them. Rogers joins a pretty high-profile list of players who many suspect have said no to the shot, including quarterbacks Kirk Cousins, Lamar Jackson, and Carson Wentz, who have been sidelined this year due to COVID protocols. Players like that change games and seasons when they can't play. I was like, oh, great, here goes home field advantage at, at Lambeau Field. On Sunday, it will be Jordan Love at quarterback for the Packers. Unlike the three-time MVP and Super Bowl winning Rodgers, he has never even started an NFL game, let alone one with this much pressure. Well, I mean, wow. what happens next? Is there any penalty for breaking NFL COVID rules? Yeah, there are penalties. And since the start of the season, there have been hundreds of thousands of penalties levied by the league against coaches, players, and the teams themselves. So that's a possibility. Of course, also the league can su suspend players, mm. too. That's on the table as well. So it's all out there. I see you in that potentially called Packers yellow. <laughs> yeah. But then the Kansas City Chiefs also have a little yellow in their I uniform, I am a dyed in the cloth Patriots fan. Yeah, I know. Oh, okay. okay. Then <laughs> <fool you. laughs> Any yellow is purely coincidence. Exactly. Okay. Absolutely. Stephanie, thank you very much. Stick around because there is much more coming up on Today in 30. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, boom. Boom. That's just cool. 
Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day Kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. <laughs> Some late breaking news for hours into the Iowa caucuses by the man who never did. All right, it just me too. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. We're back with a look at something that could change a lot of lives. That's right. MDMA, or ecstasy, is largely known as a club or street drug, but now it's being touted as a medicine for people struggling with PTSD. And Savannah, you got a first-hand look at how it works. Yeah, MDMA is now being used in conjunction with therapy, and it is yielding groundbreaking results. The FDA has designated it a, quote, breakthrough therapy after early clinical trials. And I had the chance to speak to two patients whose lives were forever transformed by this therapy. And the person leading the charge to legalize its use in therapeutic settings. I had five suicide attempts. My most recent and final suicide attempt was uh, November 4th of 2013. When all seemed lost, veteran John Lubecki decided to take one last unorthodox chance. A tiny pill ingested in a darkened room, buried under blankets, surrounded by professionals. Sometimes people report a lot of thoughts going very fast a once infamous club drug unexpectedly becoming a final hope for healing methylene dioxy methamphetamine known on the street as ecstasy or molly there was a nickname for your base yeah mortaritaville Lubecki served in Iraq in 2006 as a member of the Army National Guard. When he returned home, he was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Every single day, no matter how good or bad the day was, my brain was trying to figure out how to, how to kill myself. You and were suicidal every day? Every day. In 2014, Lubecki volunteered for a clinical trial studying whether MDMA could enhance therapy. The trial conducted by a nonprofit research organization called MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Rick Doblin is the founder and executive director. Many studies of PTSD don't work with people who have attempted to kill themselves in the past. We felt that we have to work with the people who are suffering the most. Initially used by psychotherapists in the 1970s, MDMA became a street drug in the 80s, and it was outlawed by the DEA in 1985. A lot of people still do have that image of their minds. Timothy Leary, psychedelics, counterculture, hippies. Why is that a false impression? So it's being administered in a different context under controlled settings with people that are suffering and trying to help them lead a better life and to stay alive, not to commit suicide. MAPS is in phase three trials with the FDA, studying MDMA's effectiveness in treating PTSD, but it's also studying how MDMA could be used to treat a range of issues, from alcoholism to social anxiety to people coping with life-threatening illnesses. I just felt awful. You know, I just felt like, am I not gonna be here for my boys? Andy Gold, a San Francisco-based attorney, had just finished treatment for colon cancer in 2005 when he was mistakenly told his cancer had metastasized. I gradually slipped into a small D depression. I just gradually lost uh, joy in my life. Like Lubecki, Gold later volunteered for a MAPS study of MDMA-assisted therapy, completing three eight-hour therapy sessions either under the influence of MDMA or a placebo. It quickly became clear to Andy and John what they received. About the 40-minute mark, it kicked in. I was just bowled over. It was a different experience from feeling high. 
I was not frightened. I knew that I was like in some other kind of perceptual dimension. I was able to talk about things that I had never brought up before to anyone. I wasn't even there. But he was one of my guys and... And it was okay. My body did not betray me. I didn't get panic attacks. I didn't shut down emotionally. So you've had a peak? How does it work? So one of the things that MDMA does is it reduces activity in the fear processing part of the brain, the amygdala, so that memories that are linked to this fear, somehow the fear is calmed and you can feel safe. And there's this release of oxytocin, which is the hormone of love and connection, nursing mother is. The impact of the MDMA assisted therapy sessions, transformational. The malaise sort of dissipated. I returned to myself. You don't have PTSD now? Nope, not at all. Do you feel healed? Absolutely, 100%. In a MAP study released this year, 67% of the participants in the MDMA group no longer qualified for the diagnosis of PTSD two months after treatment. What does this moment mean for psychedelic treatment? If we do succeed with our second phase three study, it means that the whole field of psychedelic psychotherapy has been proven in one instance, and it's the path breaker with the FDA. The FDA could approve MDMA for PTSD as soon as next year. In the meantime, the treatment remains largely out of reach for the 15 million adults in the U.S. currently struggling with the condition. What's your message to fellow veterans who might be watching this and suffering as you once were? This treatment's the reason that my son has a father instead of a folded flag. I want all of you to be around when this is FDA approved. You can make it. I know what the, your suffering is like. I will tell you, it's all gone. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends in today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show. In a mere 30 minutes. Oh, boom. Yes, yes, yes. Shop today with Joe Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends in today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show. In a mere 30 minutes. Oh, boom. Yes, yes, yes. Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're gonna do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening, with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life. In primetime and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at seven on NBC News Now. This morning, we're catching up with one of the funniest guys around, comedian and actor Colin Quinn. Of course, we all remember him from his four years as a cast member on Saturday Night Live. And then he kept us in stitches literally in the hit comedy train wreck. You're going to get 30 cents because that was on yesterday. I actually uh -huh. saw it. And now Colin so is returning to the stage <laughs> with his new special, The Last Best Hope. It's his latest one-man show about the current state of America. And Colin's here to tell us all about it. Good morning. Good, good to morning. see you. Good morning, guys. Thanks. Thanks. It's, just, it's just good to be in the same studio. I know. I know. It really feels good. Yeah. yeah. So eighth, eighth one-man show. Uh, what, what's this one about? Mm. It's really, uh, it's about sort of the fact that we live in two cults mm -hmm. and COVID, a lot of COVID stuff, since I had COVID twice. You know, I do a lot of COVID humor. Are you okay? Like, you feel okay? Yeah, I feel like I, was, I don't want to make you guys nervous, but, you know, I'm a, I'm a real carrier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
I think I could, I could become a contact tracer. That's so encouraging. Thank you. Yeah. And I had the, I had the uh, shots, too, too, in between. Oh, so you had, like, breakthrough? Yeah, breakthrough COVID. Yeah. Wow. But right. you made Gained it function. But you made this show around what everybody's going through yeah, right well, now. The yeah, I mean, I was kind of working on some of the stuff uh, beforehand, which is about, you know, general... You know, the country in general, but the, uh, the COVID stuff is a lot of it, you know. And here's the deal. Like, this is, you know, America themed and you do that sometimes. You did a, you know, a whole are. book on all 50 states. And I hear it. I don't know if this is true, but you have teachers in your family. Yeah, like, my whole have, family's teachers. Yeah. So that's why, you know. So have you ever thought about maybe being a history teacher or something? Well, you know, you have to have a college degree. And apparently I had some problems, uh, <laughs> I had some issues around those days. <laughs> well, you so. turned out so great. So, <laughs> so, so you're going to be, you know, doing this show. You're going to be in a theater. Um, and, and we've been through a lot in the yeah. last last two years. D do you think that audiences are ready to be together mm. and laugh, but that what makes them laugh has changed at all? Mm. Well, it's funny because, first of all, at this show, it's a theater, so they have to wear masks. But at the comedy clubs I've been doing in New York, people don't have masks. They have to be show vaccination, but no masks. And it is, it does feel like everybody, including the comedians who are usually, you know, everybody's like much more electrified mm -hmm. because, and so laughing at stuff just over the idea, like a lot, you know, darker humor and more just, you know, people are just like laughing because it's but that like, could be a good thing, right? Because yeah. then people are laughing at your jokes. It's like Germany in the 30s. People were laughing at a lot of that, like, uh, you know, cabaret type humor. Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny because he said in the green room earlier something Lauren Michaels told you like 25 years ago, right? Yes. That was based on what, what you just said. Well, Lorne Michaels said, I was talking about comedy once, and um, I was like, well, stand-up, I go, you know, bombing is the worst. I go, but you always have that tension. He goes, but that's what makes people laugh, is that tension over the fact you could bomb. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's pretty good. You know, let me ask you, I, I, I'm curious to get your take. You know, that, that comedians, you know, we're talking free speech, we're talking about sure. ideals. What, what do you make of this whole... Uh, the, the, the Dave Chappelle uh, uh, controversy, you know, with talking about transgender and, and people being upset and is he going to be canceled? Is he not going to be canceled? What do you think about that? Mm. Well, I mean, first of all, I'm of the school that comedy is not punching at all. So when people go, it's punching down or punching up, I never, I don't know who decided uh, that, that it was punching. punching. It's not punching. It's the opposite of punching. That's my opinion. I mean, I could say, you know, music is kicking, all right? I mean, you could say anything. So, I mean, as far as... Uh, that, you know, it's really weird because when I watched the Chappelle's, I watched the Chappelle's special before all this stuff happened, and my take, I was like, oh, it's nice. He's reaching a hand mm -hmm. <laughs> peace. That's what I got from it. What I got from it was he was saying, my friend who's trans was killed herself, not because of my jokes, but because social media was rat packing her. So I notice that's being left out of this whole discussion. Mm. So when you do comedy now, do you try to say, okay, no, I don't want to go there because then this person may say this, or I don't want to go there. That's what I'm wondering. You know, like, but I mean, yes, you, you you think that, but you still got to go there because you're a comedian. So it's like that's the that's where the joke is is all this tension and all these forbidden things mm. that you have to. You don't have to, but I mean, right. most comedians, are, you know, it's just that's where the fun. Like we talk about the tension mm -hmm. and the fact that people are like. <gasps> You're not supposed to say that, and it gives comedians a little titillation. Yeah. You know? Well, we're glad you're here. I'm glad you're healthy. Yeah, thanks. And hopefully you don't get yeah. it a third time. Healthy may be an exaggeration. Well, yeah. well, I mean, but you're, you're doing fine you're now. Yeah. You're, good. You're, you're good right now. I'll make it through this segment. There you I mean, go. Right I mean, this is just about over, so it's fantastic. <laughs> Colin, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, don't forget, the last best hope, playing now at the Lucille Lortel Theater right here in New York. in our changing world. Download the NBC News app. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news. All right, it is it. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. Didn't fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. 
Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. This is fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. International Day of the Girl. The strength and courage of these women is remarkable. What's your message to girls who want to make a difference? Believe in yourself. You can make it happen. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. All right, you worked hard all week. You want to spend some time being entertained. We have got you covered. We've got your weekend hit list. Yeah, okay, people, the TV shows, senior correspondent Jeremy Parson is here with the hottest music, TV, and movie releases. Hey, Jeremy. Hey, good to see you guys. How I we love, doing? I love when you whittle it down, yes. man. You make it easy, bite-sized We've got, we, size we've got some us. really good stuff. Okay. We, we really do music. Music. Hit us. Two huge artists. Here we go. ABBA. Voyage, brand new album. Look, these guys have sold. Brand new album? <laughs> They've sold 400 million records. We've loved Dancing Queen. We love Mamma Mia. And now we get a whole onslaught of new songs. They secretly kind of got together during COVID. They wrote a bunch of new music. So here we go. We can check does it, it out. Sound, does it sound like them? It sounds it? like them. I've sound little bit, heard little bits of it. Yeah. And here's the thing. The real kicker is this is all going to be part of their 3D concert experience. That's right. They are do going to be in avatar form at a venue in the UK next year. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> They've done the body suits, the whole thing, Amazing. and so they're It'll working on that. You can check out the album. Also, Diana Ross. <gasps> can you believe this icon I'm shocked. is still doing music? It's her uh, brand new Wait. music. First studio album since 2006. Original music since 99. Fans have been waiting. Just listen to that. And this, is, this, is, this is, I mean, this is the classic yeah, Diana yeah, Ross, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, look, upbeat, positive, heartfelt with the new stuff. She is excited to do it. The, it here's the quote that she had about the music. I love this. She said, as you hear my voice, you hear my heart. Oh. That's not Diana Ross. By the way, she was somebody who like kept me company throughout yes. a lot of my life. Just yeah. listening to her music. Okay, Paul McCartney, another music icon. Yeah, but now we're talking about a book. Yeah. Paul's got a book. It's called The Lyrics. It examines his life through 154 songs, wow. unseen photos, lots of memorabilia and things from his private collection. It's 900 mm. pages. Oh my God, what? Uh, it's incredible. Yeah, you can get it. What a prolific songwriter. It, prolific he was. songwriter. I recently, a few months ago, interviewed his daughter Mary. She mm -hmm. talked about spending a lot of time with her dad throughout the pandemic and his love of life and music and food and all of it. We're going to get to experience a very personal version of him here mm. and his evolution as an artist awesome. and in his life in a way that fans haven't seen before. Okay, cool. That. Let's switch to movies. People want to know what to watch. Two right. movies. We got big ones. The Harder They Fall. I love this. It's on Netflix. Idris Elba and Regina King. It's already streaming. It's an all-black western redefining yeah. the, the genre here. Very heavily stylized. Cool. Mm. And I talked to them. They were so pumped Let's to team start. up and take on these outlaw characters. Also stars uh, Jonathan Majors. He's hosting SNL. Oh, uh, coming wow. up this weekend, so we're gonna we're gonna be seeing him. Fun fact: Indra, Id Idris is allergic to horses. Oh my god! But he still jumped into a western <laughs> because he's he committed. Did. He just right? did it, doing his thing. Uh, they are so good. Him and Regina are so good together. I said, look, it seems like you two would be great in a romantic comedy. Yeah. He kind of teased. They, they can sort of tease that maybe something's in the works for that. So we'll see. We'll oh, keep our hands on the, we, on the, the way, pulse. We're huge Regina King yes, fans around right? here. Oh. And she always comes up with something amazing and I cool. also just love that we can watch that this weekend from the comfort of <laughs> your You can watch it from the it comfort of your popcorn. bed. All right. Amazing. Or you can go to the theaters and watch Eternals. It's the oh, new okay. Marvel, the huge new Marvel movie. Oh. Angelina Jolie, yes. Salma Hayek, and even Game of Thrones fans are going to love this little reunion. Uh, Kit Harington and Richard Madden are part of the cast wow. as these demigods they emerge. They've been living among us for thousands of years, but they've got to, you know, emerge and save humanity, as you do in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Wow. So this is a big screen. You definitely have to this see this. This is a big screen. screen. That's a big this screen. Yeah. Theater, All right, sure. Sunday night, you got big something night big cooking. TV. What's going on? TV shows Dexter New Blood. My I, wife is so excited for this. She lit, we were walking the kids to school yesterday morning. She stopped us in our tracks when she saw a bus with the advertisement and was like, what? What is it? Where can I see it? And I said, watch the Today Show. You'll find out. It turns out it's on Showtime. It is a, uh, a pickup 10 years later from where the show ended. Michael C. Hall's back. Yep. He has acknowledged that fans were not happy with the way the series no, ended. I, wasn't, so, I right? remember not being happy. I can't remember what happened. But, right, but it wasn't good. But now this is sort of, he's happy that this is uh, going to give fans a more satisfying storyline and, 
and we'll see though okay. if he can keep his serial killer ways in the past. Right. We're not so sure. Insecure is the other one. Insecure. It's in its fifth and final season. Issa Rae has poured her heart it's and brilliant. soul into it. 11 Emmy nominations throughout the run. Uh, she's been very passionate about this. The story of a modern but black woman in LA and the things that she faces, the comedy, the drama, the serious issues, all within this very genuine storytelling. Fans are sad to see it go, and so yeah. is the cast. I know. Uh, but you can check it out. It's, you know, it's airing now. A lot of people are obsessed with Succession. Have you been into that? I've or? been into it a bit. This yeah. is th this new season has picked up, and yeah. the people that it's one of those shows that you're either all, all in, in or you know I, everybody nothing. Around, know. Everybody around here says second season. I was out. The first I couldn't. Get, I, I couldn't get in. But can oh. I tell you what I did love? What? is Made on Netflix. Have you watched? I have it? not watched it. And that is on, it's, it's literally on our on our watch list. To do list. Really incredible. She's got a good sense, but she's just she's all in Dexter for now. Okay. Okay. Thank, you, right. Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy. People, the TV show is available at people.com, and you can pick up the latest issue of People on Newsstands Now. Come next week, it's a star studded parade. Ooh, tell me about it. Star Palooza here in 1A Ryan Reynolds, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, Will Farrell, and Paul Rudd. That's fun. Does it get any better than that? We'll see you guys on Monday. Have a great weekend. Today, all day, we've got a great show for you on this Tuesday morning, including an all-day exclusive chat you can only see here. Let's kick it off with Popstar. We check in with Carson, who's covering all the buzzy headlines, including the first trailer for the highly anticipated Game of Thrones prequel, House of the Dragon. Can you believe it's been over two years since the Game of Thrones finale aired on HBO? I can't. Take a look. Stop I was tarts. just telling him, I think maybe we should just do one story here, my Game of Thrones prequel story, and oh. then cut pop cart pop start short so I get more time with Dave, Dave, Dave Grohl. Grohl. Yes. That's good. yes. Yeah. But because I only have like four minutes with Dave and the but, book, his new book is so great and there's so much to talk about Dave. But, but I don't think but the I gotta time do rolls over. I, it doesn't. That's out. the thing. Live okay. TV. No, it doesn't work. It just no. doesn't work. You've eaten no. a lot of time no. here though. With oh, that's, there is yeah. that. Yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> uh, wow. The How meta. first trailer for the highly anticipated Game of Thrones prequel, House of the Dragon, is out this morning. It's been over two years since the finale for HBO's hit medieval fantasy show, Shock the World. Now, the stories of George R.R. R. Martin are returning to the small screen. This time, the series will take place 200 years before the events of Game of Thrones. And we'll explore the House of Targaryen. Here's a peek at it. Fire. Dragons, yes. That is epic. You guys don't look excited enough. Oh, I'm stoked. Oh. I just finished watching Game of Thrones for the second time. Yeah. Just because really? there's so much that happened that you oh, just yeah. don't, you have to go back and then you can fall into the mythology of everything that's going on with the houses and families. This is 200 years before that. Yeah, that's why it's. it's... I'm going to make a bracket out of this and do a bracket. <laughs> I'm out. 10 episodes of House of the Dragon <laughs> is set that you can Ted Lasso it and we'll. Yes. Exactly. Wow. So exactly. Dragon. HBO Max, it'll be out next year. Next up, Morgan Freeman and Dave Chappelle, The Unlikely oh. Pair. Teaming up in a new teaser to promote Chappelle's latest Netflix special called The Closer. Check out Freeman's iconic, soothing voice. Might be getting inside Chappelle's head a little bit. This is Dave. He tells jokes for a living. Driving down these country roads is a lot like a meditation. What could he possibly have left to say? Will you shut the up, Morgan Freeman? Sorry, I was, I was just, just. <laughs> <laughs>
That's a great reveal that he was actually so sitting fantastic. next to him in the passenger seat. So fantastic. Oh, my God. Oh. Brilliant, brilliant. Dave Chappelle's stand oh. special, The Closer, is out today, out today. on okay. Netflix. Next up, Tick, Tick, Boom. The new trailer is out for the upcoming Netflix musical directed by Lin-Manuel Miranda. The film's based off composer Jonathan Larson's 1990 autobiographical uh, musical. Larson was the creator behind Broadway's wildly popular show Rent. In the movie, Andrew Garfield's going to lead the cast as the young composer alongside co-stars MJ Rodriguez, Bradley Whitford, and Vanessa Hudges. Here's a peek. I have an original rock musical. Hey, boy genius. That I have spent the last eight years of my life writing. It's getting out. You're going to be rich and famous. Try writing about what you know. What does it take to wake up the generation? It would be a tragedy to give up what you have. You know, it's funny, the actor Andrew Garfield never actually sang professionally before he got the role. Wow. He was on Colbert's Late Night Show and told a story about how he, he lied to Lin-Manuel Miranda. He's <laughs> like, dude, give me the gig. I sing. I'm a great singer. And he, wow. he, Meanwhile, he didn't sing at all. So he got the, got the gig, but really? then had, before production started, he like had to take singing lessons and, cool. and then got great. So cool. it worked Until you make it. Yeah. Uncle Al, here's for you now. Oh. No Game of Thrones. We're going to go right into your wheelhouse. Peanuts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the gang's back, returning with a new holiday special this December on Apple TV Plus, yes. titled For Old Lang Syne. Oh. The special is set on, you guessed it, New Year's Eve. Oh. In the episode, Charlie Brown will try to accomplish one of his New Year's resolutions before the clock strikes midnight, while Lucy is busy throwing a big holiday party. Oh, boy. This. Oh, can't wait. That new special set to hit Apple TV Plus on December. Mm. That's going to be good. Uh, okay, now, yeah. Oh, wait, one more? Yeah. One more? Yeah. All right. Adele. Adele is in the news today. Grammy winner is back, at least on Twitter. You know, yesterday there was a massive Facebook outage of sorts. The singer mm -hmm. sent out her first tweet in nine months, replying to social media platforms, hello, literally everyone, with, hiya, babes. Uh -huh. <laughs> this, of course, only heightened all the speculation that Adele just might be gearing up to put a new album out. Mm -hmm. Over the weekend, the internet fans posted these photos of mysterious billboards with the signs of the number 30 from all over the world. A lot of people speculating that 30 is going to be the singer's fourth album title, which makes sense. It follows the previous record's themes of 19, 21, and 25. Those were all the n names of the records, and they were named after the age Adele was oh. when she re released the record. But um, Adele's 33 now. Oh. oh. So maybe the 30. Maybe it's when she wrote the record. Oh. Could be that. Oh, yeah. That's possible. Oh. Well, that's to be continued. Oh. Up next on Today Talks, the third hour gang talks to Savannah Sellers about a new app that's helping the next generation of politicians get their start. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, I know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go! International Day of the Girl. The strength and courage of these women is remarkable. What's your message to girls who want to make a difference? Believe in yourself. You can make it happen. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go! International Day of the Girl. The strength and courage of these women is remarkable. What's your message to girls who want to make a difference? Believe in yourself. You can make it happen. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Today on the third hour, Savannah Sellers shows us how a new app is helping the next generation of political leaders get their start. This morning, a look at how one popular app is helping the next generation of politicians get their start. NBC News correspondent and host of Stay Tuned, Savannah Sellers is here. You're going to tell us how this works. I am, and I think you'll be pretty fascinated because of how simple it makes it, because young people are ready to take office. One report from the Millennial Action Project found a 266% increase in millennials running for Congress from 2018 to 2020. Now, Snapchat is giving us an exclusive look at a new tool they're rolling out today to help guide future leaders. 
I believe that everyone has the power to create a certain amount of change in their own way. 17-year-old Trinity Sanders is student body president of Shenandoah High School in upstate New York. So you want to run for office? Definitely, 100%. She's hoping her 4.0 GPA and hard work will eventually help her trade her current office for an even higher one. My dream is to um, run for U.S. Senate. I actually have this conversation with my parents all the time, and I'm saying, well, you know, this is what I want to do, and they're like, go fight for your dreams and go get them. And I'm like, well, where do I really go from there? She's not alone. America's next generation of politicians is ready to get their names on a ballot. They often just don't know how. I am actually 100% confident that I probably will run for office. It is pretty difficult to know where to start. I don't know how much money I need. I don't know like where to even begin. I don't know like what kind of degree I need or like what the best route to take is. But now they have a starting point on Snapchat. We know from the civic tools that we've built already that Snapchatters want them. During the 2020 election, we helped over 1.2 million Snapchatters register to vote. Was this like Young people don't really know how to do this, so let's enter that space. Exactly. We see how many barriers there are for young people able to participate in public life and civic engagement. And this generation has grown up being able to do whatever they want from their phones. Currently, only 6% of state legislators are under the age of 35. And so if Snapchatters want to make sure that the issues they care most about are represented by leadership, then they need to run. Now users just need to open the app on their phone, navigate to SNAP's Run for Office tool, and enter their zip. So I'm from San Diego, California, so we're gonna try San Diego zip code. Let's do it. Okay. So this is wild that you just put in a zip code and it tells you just right there, hyper-locally, 29 positions available? Exactly. And then it'll show you the full description of the election, some of the requirements you need, and what the minimum age and when the general election will be. From there, Snapchatters can match with a variety of candidate recruitment organizations across the political spectrum, like Run For Something. So Run For Something does everything from helping you figure out how to actually get on the ballot. So we have guides on how to file in all 50 states to what you do when you're actually on the ballot. If I'm able to actually have someone that has experience with mentoring um, politicians, and you know, I definitely would take anyone up on that offer. Do you think Gen Z is ready to run? I dare to say that Generation Z is the most involved politically and 100% ready generation to create change. Now, Snap is, of course, known for its fun filters, you know, those dog faces and such. But they say friend interaction is a huge important part of this tool and, of course, the platform. So if Snapchatters use this and they see a position that their friend might be a good fit for, they can nominate them by sending them more info about it on the app. The idea here is to get younger people involved in these races that have gone uncontested. how it starts. Yeah. Yep. I wow. take it seriously. Well, that's right. Yeah. Anything to shake up the system. Have exactly. professional yeah. candidates with little cat ears. And how easy yeah. the tool is. I mean, it's, that's what's pretty cool about it. Yeah. Savannah Sellers, right. thank you. Thanks for keeping us connected to the I kids. Know. That's, that's right. what I'm here for. Thank you. <laughs> Coming up on Huda and Jenna, my latest read with Jenna book club pick. It's one of my favorite books ever, and I'm going to tell you why. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. <laughs> More good people than bad people, you know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. By the man from the Richards. All right, it just did too. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? Some late breaking news for hours into the Iowa caucuses. Private man, the Richards. All right.
This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back. Today on Hood Engine, I reveal my latest Read Witch in a Book Club selection, and I'll let you in on why you need to pick up this book ASAP. The world went cray yesterday because no one could get on Insta. <laughs> Did you see? People are like, I get in the car this morning, and Eddie goes, Wow, you got a busy news day. I go, yeah, yeah. I go, what, <laughs> what do you mean? He goes, well, because my wife couldn't get on Insta, so that's God. It's got to be. And I go, no, Eddie, that's going to be. We have a lot yeah, of stories. Nobody the oil cares. Spill. Blah, 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 blah. I came in, they're like, okay, we're leading with the Facebook and the Instagram <laughs> thing. I was like, wow. But six hours, when you can't get on for six hours. Can I say how, how embarrassed? I'll just tell you. Yeah. I was in the cab on the yeah. way home from work. Yeah. Going home. Yeah. Scrolling. Reset, 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 resetting. Refresh. I mean, Nothing. let's be honest. How many times did you refresh? I refreshed 47 yeah, times. Yeah, well, because I you thought it was app, yours. You thought it was me. me. Yeah, and, and then, then at the some Wi-Fi. Point, I realized it was that it wasn't shutdown. just me. But and imagine that we, and I know that I, look, there are businesses that rely on Facebook and Instagram yes. and WhatsApp. People rely on WhatsApp to communicate with people. Right. It's not like no. everything's a luxury and looking at the kid with the cats and oh my God, how cute. <laughs> it's not all that, but it may be the only thing we cannot live without for six hours. It if someone said you couldn't eat for six hours, you'd be like, oh, fine. well, if you can't get onto your apps for six well, hours. And I have to say, I was very productive. <laughs> you were? Who are you winking just, at? No, a nice lady was just waving out the window. You can't not wave. You, hey. you didn't wave, but you. No, but I didn't know. Oh, it's it's the like she's right there. You can wave to her. No, she just. Yes, oh, she did. Hi. hi. How are Super you? Super nice. But you know when you're at dinner with like, yeah. with maybe your. Yeah. It, look at you. No, but you she's might holding as well up be an on a date item. with her. I don't know. She was holding up an item. This is okay. what happens when I go to dinner with, with Henry sometimes. Usually I'm you, though. We're in the middle of a conversation oh, yeah. about the world ending, and you're no, looking over here at her. Not the world ending. Facebook being turned off for six hours. Well, it was very dramatic in my cab. Well, the host from Late Night had fun with it. Let's take a look. People started noticing something was wrong this morning when they felt happy for more than 30 minutes. Now, clearly, this is the day the machines have risen up and are taking over. But don't panic. They only know our thoughts, feelings, family, friends, location, facial patterns, and banking data. <laughs> yes, Facebook's entire site crashed. They were like, oh my God, this is the best press we've had in months. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Anyway, it was a big deal for lots of people. Oops, I, I know I did to, that. We've been um, having a little bit of a recola during the thing. We so both they, put it in, and, and then we, we take, take it, out. it out. Things are contagious. Watching someone put something in their mouth, get watch it. If I pick up yes. my phone, you pick up yours. If I yawn, you yawn. If I yawn, you yawn. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it is time for Tuesday. Tuesday, we've missed it for last week, I think. So we're going to let our viewers pick what we are going to wear this week. Okay, here's a special spin, though. This Tuesday, Tuesday is different. We're actually getting a real stylist, what? a fashion stylist at Rent the Runway. Okay. These are what she picked for you and I, knowing our personalities. Shall we see how Okay, let's see. I'm dying. Let's see. Wow. Leopard. Meow. Leopard pants and a black top, a purple dress. What is that? A little suit. What is it's a C? little, it's a, that's a that's plaid suit. That's a top. That's a plaid suit. Oh, and look at, the, it looks like shorts and a top, oh, but it's all one thing. Okay, I like my choices. Okay, well, should we see, see mine? Jenna's, sure. I can't wait. I pick, I pick Okay, B. let's see. Oh, let's looky, looky. Wow. Ooh, these are cute. Um, <laughs> there's somebody behind yeah, there. that's all Okay, right. a skirt with a turtleneck. I kind of like, that's cute. I bet that looks cute on you. A pant and a top and, and a yellow up. dress. You're either gonna, I like, I like them all. I like B though, for you. I kind of like A. You like it, yeah. But, but let's not, you know, who knows? That's kind of cool. So we no, have an actual stylist. It. Okay, whoops. Are you, Sorry. Was that a hanger? Yeah. Uh, what that is was happening? Something. I don't know. Stuff, stuff's All not right. right today. Everything's going wrong well, today. Well, it's because Mercury is in retrograde. <gasps> is that why I spilled the coffee? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. That's why you spilled the coffee? That's why you're staring at this woman over there I instead of listening why? to me? I am listening to you. I'm all, I only Can have eyes for you. Can I say what also was supposed to happen last night? Oh. So, 
since I was a little girl, I've had a problem, and this is the problem. If my parents said, today we're going to do something really fun, I would think that we were going to Disney World. Yeah. They would think we were going to lunch Cracker at the place Barrel. we go to lunch. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Crackle Barrel, yeah. Mickey D's. Yeah, Mickey D's. So I have high expectations. <laughs> Last night, we were supposed to do a surprise shoot. We had to cancel it. I said to them, is this surprise really going to hold my expectations? Because I thought maybe we could just like end up at Times Square. You yeah, know? It's a, we, they were surprising us with an activity that we didn't know about. In we're New just going to go there in New York City. Well, we figured out what the surprise was. And, and we didn't go. It was Harry, Harry Styles. Styles concert. I know. The Harry we Styles concert. We were going concert. to be there at Madison Square Garden. With Harry himself. Well, he wouldn't have seen us, you think? Well, he was going to wave, I think, oh, at us okay. or something. I'm not exactly anyway, sure. Anyway, it's such a bummer. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. The truth is expectations yeah. really never meet reality. <laughs> it, and the best advice one. is to lower your expectations until last night. Wow, that was going to be really good. Well, maybe they'll have another surprise for us. Maybe. Won't be that. Okay, this is a big day, though. We, I love the first of the month when you announce your new books. I and mean, this one, everybody's raving about. Even Roker was talking about I know. About Roker's it. already read it. So October Book Club pick. Drum roll, please. It is the Lincoln Highway by Amor Tolls. It tells the story of an 18-year-old. His name is Emmett. He's dropped off at home in Nebraska after serving 15 months at a juvenile prison. Okay. Okay, but the only issue is what happens? two of his bunkmates who are who are raucous and kind yeah. of wild have snuck out of the jail. They've escaped, <gasps> and they are in the warden's car, and they all go on this cross-country epic journey. It's set oh, in 1950s wow. America. <gasps> the Lincoln Highway is actually a real highway. It starts in Times Square, so we can visit it, and, and it goes, goes all, all the way, way to California. And how many days does the book It cover? only spans 10 days, okay. but really, it, it, and it, it varies in mm -hmm. narrator from all of these really cool, incredible characters. It, it go, and you find out sort of why they are who they are. Okay. It's about home and hope, family. It's going to make you want oh, to go on an I epic get adventure. It. It is so good. I'm kind of embarrassed by how enthusiastic I was in the 8 o'clock. <laughs> but that's, well, just because I was like, you were excited over. Yes. I love this book yes. so much. And I hope y'all will read with us. You can join the book club chat by going to day.com slash read with Jenna. And soon to be a movie, as they all do. <laughs> all right, it's time for Unscripted. Okay, so what are you watching now? Like, what's the new I'm thing not you're watching? watching anything. Nothing. Are you? Every, but I, every time someone tells me what, what they're watching, I always go, when? When are you watching all the, when? Like, when? I'm not. Is it possible? I am yeah. not watching anything. I, the last thing I've seen, which Ted I... Ted Lasso. Well, yeah. Oh, I haven't even finished Ted Lasso. Yeah, Ted Lasso. Okay, what else? Did you see Ted Lasso this not season? The, not the rest of it. I've did, seen a couple of them Did you get season. to the Christmas edition? No, I haven't gotten to that yet. It's That's really good. good. But I need to finish it. Thank yes. you for reminding me. I've been reading a lot. And but the last thing we watched <laughs> is... Stop showing off. It's not a show off. <laughs> That's what I've been doing. That's just so rude. First of all, you listen to a lot of motivational speeches and su such, just in your free time. By the time. way, Denzel Washington, there's one. You wait, see? wait, 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 wait. There's one where Denzel is giving a commencement address. And it's, if you look up, if you Google Denzel Washington, like commencement address, it's something that someone did and they made it like a movie. I was watching this commencement address. It was amazing. Oh, she just said, <laughs> no, but when do you have the time? To read. Hoda has the time <laughs> to, to like get somehow Google Denzel Washington commencement address because she's heard it was delightful and then watch it and then probably journal about it and then podcast about it. And then, by we, the way, that stuff is great for podcasts. You love, I love stuff speeches. like that. How many I speeches, love speeches. A, a day do you listen to? No, I, I listen to a few a day, but I love a because, few a day. well, think about it though. When you find someone who, look, I've seen you give a speech. You give a great speech. I've watched in a room where you hold people in the palm of your hands. I'm into it. You put it out there. It's beautiful. Some people, I just love to watch it. It's almost like watching, sometimes it's like, some people give them like sermons. It's like they take yes. you up and they take you down. And they tell you, where are we going? Where are we going? But the fact we don't know. That, that Hoda just said, I was showing off by reading, which well, is reading a very is fundamental no. activity. <laughs> and you Google <laughs> speeches that make you feel good. You know, motivational speeches and listen to a few actually, a day. I want to actually want to read more. I really do because I gave I you, feel, a you gave me a lot. I wanted books. you to read. So don't look at me with those eyes. Which book? Beautiful the new one? Country. Oh, that one. I'd yes. like you to read the other. I'd like you to read the new one, but it's so you've got to get to. It's thick, but it's good. And by the way, I read it twice.
The thick one? Because the I new one? I read it so long ago, you I couldn't, couldn't remember. remember, and I'm interviewing it's him. It's super thick, that book. <laughs> that it, book. You read it fast, though. <laughs> Today Talks continues after the break. Hoda and I go unscripted, and we have an exclusive chat you can only see here on Today All Day. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. This is fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go! International Day of the Girl. The strength and courage of these women is remarkable. What's your message to girls who want to make a difference? Believe in yourself. You can make it happen. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcast. Welcome back to Today Talks, our exclusive content you can only see here on Today All Day. Yes. That story you did about that young woman, yes. will you just give me a few more details yes. because I fell in love with her. Gloria Calderon Kellett, yeah. um, for those who don't know, she is this amazing showrunner, creator, writer, producer. And she is just not only advocating that representation matters, but she's actually putting pen to paper yeah. in order for her community to be seen, for the Latinx, Hispanic community to be well, seen. Well, I love that she was like, usually when she was booked for a gig, it was yeah. be like, you're the girlfriend of the whatever. Right. The, 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 the bad the guy. Gang bangers, the gangbanger's girlfriend. Bangers girlfriend. And she was like, I got sick of it. Yeah. And people, I don't think people realize. I remember when they were doing my big fat Greek wedding, mm -hmm. They were saying that originally, when that script was written, they had asked Nia Var Vardalos yep. to not make it a Greek family, make it an Hispanic family, or change it somehow. And she was like, but wait, that's what it is. And they, you know, it's yeah. like people don't understand, like, if you are not represented, what it feels like. And how often do we quote my big fat Greek wedding? Yes. All the time. Yes. But you and me especially, like, we relate to that yes. family, that yes. culture, you know, it's so we interesting. We love that. But that, but, she, yeah, so glory she, back she to her. was doing that, too. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, it was interesting because she said originally she wanted to be an actress. That's yeah. why she wanted to be in the industry. Right. And she realized, actually, the change makers, the people who create right. the stories are right. the ones who are going right. to create that change. And right. so she, self, she was self-taught. She went to school, but she also, you know, taught herself at libraries and through watching, you know, different shows. And also just, you know, I, I think a big thing for her was when Norman Lear tapped her to uh -huh. create, to recreate um, One, Day, One at Day at a Time. time. Yeah. She was so excited, but, you know, it was one of those things where her, you know, co-producer was Mike Royce. Mm -hmm. who is American and white, yeah. and, and same with Norman Lear. But the two of them, the reason she felt so comfortable is that the two of them completely let her let make her any changes wow. that she yeah. deemed fit I and reasonable. There's something so cool about her. I, I think it's her, she has the perfect blend of kind of humility mm -hmm. and being a hard driving person. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes you feel like you have to be one of those. Mm -hmm. You can't have humility and also be aggressive in your craft, but she is. Yeah. She's she, like, oh, no one's gonna walk all over me. I'll be kind. How did you, like, what was your moment when you realized, because that is a really hard bag to, to kind of yeah. create for yourself, but yeah. it is a cutthroat industry. and. Was there ever a moment for you specifically where you realized, like, I can be equal parts nice and equal parts get what I want? Well, you know who I think was the epitome of that whole thing was Meredith Vieira, mm -hmm. because she was kind in every single aspect. I never saw her in all the years she worked here, she's worked at The View, mm -hmm. she worked yeah. at 60, all those years, she was always kind. And I always, I used to think, I used to think it was like sharks swimming around at the mm -hmm. networks, that's what it was like. But when I saw Meredith, mm -hmm. I realized, wait a second, 
these are really nice people who mm -hmm. care about everybody. They talk to every, you know, they talk mm -hmm. to our awesome crew. They hang out. They listen, and they're also wildly successful. Yeah. So it doesn't mean you're going to get walked all over, but you, I think you can be kind. And yeah. I think in my career, I've sort of always tried. Not even tried. I think that's just the way that's it is. That's who you are. Like, so. if you were to go back and ask the cameraman for every single person mm -hmm. who worked here, people who worked with them, what were they like for yeah. real? Tell me the real story. Tell me what it was like when no one was around. Then you'd really know. Yeah. But I think it's. I think in our industry, and I think this NBC is is. I think shows that mm -hmm. you, I, I we have too. nice people yeah. who work here who get it done. I know and who people are always want to know: Is Hoda really that nice? I'm like, oh, girl, you have no idea. Oh, oh, Lord. <laughs> but yes, it's it's true. So I, I just really enjoyed my my interview good. with her. She was and, great. That was a ten plus she, plus. Yeah, I know. We, she'll be we, coming back. Good. We want her to come here and work here. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Anyway, that's it for this episode of Today Talks. Keep watching for more of Today All Day.